Hey everyone, I'm Quincy, coming to you from Dallas, Texas, uh, United States of America. I, I am thrilled, thrilled to be here to open Lockdown Conf, and we have some amazing interviews, uh, some ama amazing panels with some really incredible developers from around the world today. We are also going to be delving into four different topics that I think are very near and dear to all of our hearts these days, continuing your learning, working from home effectively, finding a job during this pandemic, this unprecedented change in lifestyle for pretty much everybody around the world, this massive economic shock, and finding freelance opportunities. And we're going to find that there are many, many opportunities out there, even in the tragedy, uh, the human tragedy and, and the chaos of this pandemic. So, first, I would love to introduce Fuzzle. He is uh, the co-founder of Hashnode, which is an amazing developer community where you can go, you can configure your developer, your dev blog. You can have a blog running right on your website uh, on your own domain. You can set it up really quickly. You can customize it. It's a really powerful tool. And just so just check out Hashnode if you haven't. I created a Hashnode blog a while back. Uh, I think it's amazing. Uh, and then, of course, he's going to be with me the entire time, co emceeing fielding questions from the audience from both Twitter and from our live chat as a spam countermeasure and also to support the Free Code Camp nonprofit. <laughs> I'll just be completely candid about that. Uh, we are uh, limiting the chatting on the YouTube video. Uh, to people who are willing to become members on YouTube. Uh, I think it's it scales with which city you're in. So if you're in India, I think it's like the equivalent of two US dollars. I think in the US it's, it's closer to five dollars. Um, I'm not sure what it is in other cities, but th those are the two prices I've heard. Um, and this money goes to funding Free Code Camp, uh, which is creating lots of free learning resources for people around the world. So uh, first I'd like to introduce Angie Jones, she is a quality assurance engineer expert. She's been doing this for a long time. She is a developer evangelist at Apple Tools, um, and she's also the director of the Test Automation U uh, learning resource. I strongly recommend you check her out. Follow her on Twitter. Uh, her information should be in the description, as with all the other uh, panelists today in the description down below. You can just scroll down, you can just command click or control click, open up all those awesome people on Twitter, follow them. There. I follow all of them. They're all super interesting on Twitter. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us, Angie. Um, next, Emma Bastian coming to us from Karlsruhe uh, in Germany. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, she is a uh, prolific developer and podcaster. You may have heard the Ladybug podcast. Uh, I strongly recommend following her on Twitter as well. Uh, she is constantly doing exciting things. And then, of course, Dawal Shah, uh, the founder of classcentral.com, which you may very well have used in the past month. Uh, they've been growing very rapidly uh, because they have indexed, I don't know, thousands, maybe a hundred thousand reviews at this point of different free online courses and, and paid online courses like Udemy courses and stuff. Uh, it's a great place to find courses to figure out what, uh, how you want to learn, what kind of resources you want to use, which universities uh, are putting out the best courses. So it's a great way to just find the best courses to learn. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you, Quincy. It's Thanks a pleasure to, to co-host. Yes, thank you. Yeah, great to be here. All right. So first, uh, I think we should just open it up. This, the topic of this first panel is learning to code during the pandemic, uh, during the in the age of social distancing. I think the first thing that's going to be on pretty much everybody's mind is, you know, how should they best use, in just general terms, how should they best use this block of time that fate has handed them 
assuming that like activities that used to occupy a lot of their, their free time are now just spent sitting at home. Uh, how, how should they best use that, uh, in your opinion? And, and we'll go ahead and start with Angie. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, let me let me start off by saying that, you know, this is a trying time for everyone. So um, personally, I've been, you know, having ups and downs as far as my moods and um, the time, this this time that we feel we have available. Some days it's not it's just a a myth. Right. Um, It feels like I have this extra time. Um, but you know, I have, I still have my job to do. Um, if you have kids at home, that's additional work as well. And if you're just not feeling up to it, you're just not feeling up to it. And I think that that's okay. So I just want to preface anything I say with that. All right. Um, for me, I love learning new things. Um, I'm a teacher at heart as well. Um, so I'm trying to produce lots of content for people who are at home and want to level up um, during this time. Um, as far as my own learning, my own uh, productivity, I I use my updates, right? So the days that I am feeling good and I'm feeling productive and I'm kind of tuning out the news are the days that I'm able to delve into all of the things that are out there. There's so much content. Free Code Camp, plenty of content there. Um, Just all over the web, there's all of these courses and things like that um, that you can take, a lot of them for free. So that's my recommendation. Like, find what's the skill that you want to learn. Don't try to learn, like, all of the things during this time. But pick, like, one or two things that um, you would like to master during this time and find the few the resources to do so. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that comprehensive, insightful answer, Angie. And and I just want to echo what Angie said. It's totally fine during this unprecedented time, especially if you have family members who are sick or if you're concerned that you yourself have become sick uh, with COVID-19 or, or <clears throat> if you have other medical issues and you're just anxious about not being able to go to the hospital like normal uh, or see a doctor like normal, uh, please don't make learning the number one priority, like staying sane and, uh, just having a healthy lifestyle and having serenity. Those are the top priority. And, uh, thank you very much for, uh, coming right out and saying that at the beginning, Angie, because that's one thing I want to, uh, definitely emphasize to everybody. Like you don't need to make personal sacrifices, significant personal sacrifices. Uh, I mean, you may have to give up playing Fortnite or watching Netflix for a, a few hours, but you, but you shouldn't be giving up sleep. You shouldn't be giving up, uh, prayer or meditation or however it is that you stay centered. Um, Emma, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, prioritizing and figuring out what you want to learn during this period? Definitely. I just want to reiterate what Angie said because I believe that that is so um, vital right now is you can't learn new skills if you are not okay as a person. So first and foremost, take care of yourself. Um, you know, I've been struggling with motivation the past few weeks. I was actually supposed to go visit my family uh, for the first time in over a year, and I had to cancel that trip, so I won't see them for another year. And so for me, mentally, that was really hard, but I was also in the midst of preparing for technical interviews. And so I had to balance studying and learning new skills with the emotional distress of living in a foreign country and being isolated from my family. So it kind of all depends on your personal goals. So if your goal is to look for a new job, because many of us have been laid off, um, which is very unfortunate, kind of come up with a plan for yourself. You know, looking for a full-time job is is a full-time job. So figure out what you need to learn and kind of chunk those into digestible pieces every single day. Don't overwork yourself. Um, But if your goal is to improve your skills in your day job or to learn something new, find what you're passionate about or pick one skill to learn really really well. Um, This is the time to become T-shaped. So having, you know, vertical knowledge in one area, but also branching out to new areas and and just picking up tangential skills is really important. And, uh, you know, not to just be uh, totally all about free code camp, even though I'm a fan girl. Um, I did use free code camp a lot the past several weeks and it landed me a new job, a, a dream job. So I personally would recommend it to anyone looking to improve their skills in web development. Thank you very much uh, for the, uh, we're, we're so thrilled to hear about uh, your new job and, and we're excited like 
course, whenever you get a new job, you want to like focus on getting that. But at some point, we would love to have a, a write up from you about your your path to getting that job and, and the decisions you made and how you did it along the way. Um, Absolutely. Thank you, Emma. Uh, Dalwal, so you have a really deep knowledge of this, but maybe you want to say something about uh, balance because I know you're very athletic and a lot of the things you enjoy doing, you're not able to do at the moment. Yeah, I, lo- I usually love to play badminton and that's uh, I've been doing remote for a few years now and badminton was my one contact with society. So I try to you know, work out at home or you know, uh, for a long time, uh, while working on Class Central, uh, badminton was the only thing that got me away from it. So I think you should, there are other things that you can learn which are not stressful, which are not job related. So you can also start learning just for fun so that it does. So there is no pressure that you need to understand the material. I would specifically recommend a course called Learning How to Learn, which also sets you up for like other courses that we'll do in the future. And it's also very entertaining and a light course that I took it a few years ago. And it's some of the techniques that I learned in that course I apply still uh, every day. Awesome. Yes. Uh, Barbara Oakley, she's an amazing uh, university professor, but also just teacher. And, and she's very passionate about learning. And that really comes through in that course. And I believe that's the most popular course on that's the most popular MOOC of all, uh, Massive Open Online Courses. Uh, is it still? I think it's one, it's it's that one or it's Andrew Ng's machine learning course. One of those two. Yeah. And, and by the way, just to reiterate, if you ever wondered about Massive Open Online Courses, like these free university courses you keep hearing about, uh, Dabal is, dare I say, one of the world's foremost experts on this, having run Class Central for... How many years at this point? Seven, eight years? Eight years, eight and a half. Yeah. Eight and a half. Yeah. So any questions anybody has about university courses, this is a perfect time to ask them. I'm just going to very quickly read a couple comments uh, from the chat. Uh, uh, Catalan Pitt uh, uh, said, coming from someone who suffered from severe anxiety and burnout, nothing is more precious than your health. Take care of yourself, everyone. And Beth Jackson said, I love how Angie and Emma... Uh, started with uh, just giving us all permission to check in with ourselves and how we we're feeling. Uh, so there's uh, I, I've been gathering questions uh, from both uh, the hashtag lockdown conf and just monitoring the chat. Uh, and if anybody asks a question that I'm like, oh, this is a great question, I'm going to feel that uh, I will I'll do so. So be sure to ask in the chat or tweet with the hashtag lockdown conf. Uh, but I'd like to know a little bit about time management. So time management slash procrastination management. <laughs> uh, let's start with you, Angie, because I know you're uh, precocious and you learn a whole lot and uh, you're constantly learning new things. Um, how do you manage your time and how do you keep yourself moving forward even without like some structure to impose upon you to force you to perform and learn new things? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was really difficult for me for a while because I, I am ambitious and I want to learn like all the things um, and do all the things. And it was really difficult to keep up. And I'm sure we've all been in a place where you start some tutorial and you never finish it or you start some side project and then it starts collecting dust. Um, I'm known on Twitter for spanking people's hands when they buy new domain names that they're never going to use. <laughs> um <laughs> What I've learned to do is uh, is form systems. For example, my um, go-to is Trello. So I use Trello um, to manage everything: my work, my side project, my side projects, my uh, learning, everything. Like I make cards for them, um, and that was working for a little while, and then it stopped working, um, and so. I went a step further just to be a little bit more rigid and actually put like dates on all of the cards, you know, like at work. <laughs> and, um, you know, here, here's where I'm slotting out the dates. Some people also use their calendars in a similar way, like, okay, um, let me block out this time for learning or whatever. Right. Um, and so I, I'm not that structured. Like I don't like 
oh, at six o'clock I have to do X, Y, and Z. Um, so I, I, I do it in a form of days. So today, here are the five things I would like to do. And I have that today column on my um, Trello board or whatever. And so I kind of plan it. I might take like a Sunday or something and plan out my week. Um, and that way I'm making sure I'm getting done the things that I want to get done, including the things for my own professional development. Okay, awesome. It sounds very organized and a systematic approach to tackling <laughs> procrastination. Yeah, but there's one issue with that uh, managing the Trello board is uh, people often forget to revisit that board. Uh, like once you move with your day-to-day -day, uh, life, uh, you get you come across something which is more important than what you had actually planned. So how do you manage those? How do you try to stay uh, in the same schedule that you had actually planned? What's your trick, Angie? Yeah, I live out of this board. So I don't know about you all, but in the world of so many distractions, even before COVID, um, you kind of just get sidetracked a lot. Like, what am I supposed to be doing? What, what was I working on? You know, mm -hmm. um, so I live out of this board. So I never forget to come back to it because I forget what I'm supposed to be doing. And so it's like, oh, let me go to my board. Oh, yeah, yeah. This was the task that I needed to do next. And you're right. Things do come up. My boss might yeah. contact me like, Angie, I need a blog post ASAP. It's like, yeah. that wasn't really on my list of things today. <laughs> so you kind of, you know, reprioritize. And, and although it sounds structured, trust me, I'm like very kind of fluid. So um, I don't mind like changing a date on something like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm not going to be able to um, read Emma's new blog post today. Let me put that for tomorrow or something. Great. Yeah, and, and how about you, Emma? What what approaches have you used? Um, so I think my biggest, um, I'm taking notes because I don't want to forget this point. I think it's really important. So I'm going to start with the fact that <laughs> I am definitely one of those people who like takes a ton of courses and like has to finish them. I can't start one and not finish it. Like it's the same with reading books. So I like waste a lot of time in all honesty taking courses that I don't need to be taking. But in any case, um, I like to think about learning as kind of like from the financial world perspective, I do a lot of learning about finances and how if you're going to buy something large, think about how much time you have until you need to buy that thing and then kind of amortize that over every single day that you um, have until the deadline. So if I have an interview coming up in two weeks, what are all the things that I need to learn? And let's amortize learning all of those things over every single day. Let's break it up into even pieces so you're not completely overwhelmed. So I did that when I was studying for technical interviews, but I never pushed myself. So if I mentally was not in a place where I knew I could digest information, I wouldn't, I wouldn't learn. Uh, it's just, uh, it's not practical to push yourself if you're not in a learning mind space. Um, but that being said, there's also this concept of intentional procrastination, which is something that I practice. So it's pushing tasks off um, to a later time, but in the in the back of your mind, like your subconscious mind is putting pieces together. Um, so if I have a big project, like I won't start working on it right away, because likely all of this, that work I'm going to be doing is going to change over the course of a week. So as opposed to doing all that work, I'm actually just processing it in the back of my mind, push off the tangible work until a later date. And by that point, I've kind of worked out the kinks in my head. Um, but there's a really great book called um, uh, Why We Sleep. And it talks about how we form new connections when we're sleeping. So make sure you're getting enough sleep. It's more important than you think. You can't actually build new, me not new memories, but you can't build new synapses, create new synapses in your brain to learn these new concepts if you're not sleeping enough. So that's my my biggest tip. Right. Intentional procrastination. Did I get that right? Yeah. That's definitely the term of the day for me because it seems like <laughs> almost, yeah, it seems like a self-contradictory term, but that makes so much sense because you're right. So much of the work is going gonna, is gonna to change down the road. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that with us. And, and just to be 100% clear, the name of that book again, Why We Sleep? Um, why we sleep. Yeah. There's another one called make it stick that I haven't read yet. It's next up on my docket, but it's about how different learning styles, uh, kind of work 
the the most efficiently with you and your preferred learning style. So if I like to watch uh, video tutorials, that might actually not be the most efficient way for me to learn. So I'd also recommend that one. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the book recommendations. Just a pop quiz. What time did everybody go to sleep last night in your local time zone? 3 a.m. <laughs> no, that hurts me. I did 11, 11 p.m. Okay, great. So, yeah, sleep. this is... Oh. <laughs> what time? Did you I usually oh. sleep at 4 a.m., so... I oh, my goodness. Well, to be fair, everyone's like... Uh, what are those called? Your cycles. I'm losing my English. Uh, everyone's circadian rhythms are different, especially through mm -hmm. ages. But like, I'm usually in bed by 10, not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. No, it's great to, to hear both Angie and Emma are uh, early sleeper, or relatively early sleepers. Um, yeah. No, I just knew I had to be here at the crack of dawn, but you. <laughs> I'm not <really> late. <laughs> so, just for some context for everybody tuning in, you may be wondering, like, if you're in California, why is this conference so so early? Well, we have lots of friends in in uh, in Asia, and uh, and uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that, it, especially down in Australia, Oceanica, like, we wanted to make sure that they were able to to come as well. And the, the best time to do things generally is like really early U S time. <laughs> it kind of inconveniences Americans, but it, it's, it makes it possible for everybody else to attend without having to stay up super duper late. So, uh, thanks. If, if you're one of those people who like woke up super early to watch this, we appreciate it. Uh, you're taking one for the entire global team. <laughs> and, uh, Dawal, let's, let's talk about you like time management, uh, and managing procrastination. What are some uh, insights you've had on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very similar to Emma and uh, what she talked about intentional procrastination uh, or uh, Barbara Oakley actually calls it like diffused mode of thinking. So what are like some of these uh, concepts are, you see them across different productivity books. So like learning how to learn is what taught me about a uh, diffused mode of thinking and it made me comfortable with procrastination. So I don't really do a lot of time management right now. I just have a simple sublime text list which keeps growing. And if it's not important, I don't come back to it, you know. So, and I try, like, I think my biggest tip has been for me is not to feel guilty about procrastination. So especially when you're creating something new, it's, you know, I think procrastination is natural and uh, yep. I usually sit on it, let it sit in my head for a while, and it's usually when you get to it, it you do it much faster. I think right. it has such a negative connotation, classically, and I, I would love to change that stigma. I think it can be used as a tool if you use it properly. Right. Procrastination can be kind of a compass needle that shows you where you actually need to go because the one thing that you are procrastinating is probably the most important thing that you need to do, right? Yeah. I also, really quickly, I'm going to throw out one more book recommendation because it's great in terms of achieving your goals, especially when you're trying to learn. And that's Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I promote this book every chance I get because it's my favorite. But essentially, it talks about instead of setting goals, just make sure you're on the right trajectory to achieving some sort of um, mindset, but also change your mindset. So like if you are trying to quit smoking, for example, identify as a non-smoker as opposed to saying, I don't smoke, or I'm sorry, as opposed to saying like, oh, I quit smoking, say I'm not a smoker. Uh, and changing your mindset and saying, I am a full stack developer that will help you achieve these milestones and make sure you're on the right trajectory. That That's great, very practical advice. Uh, just a very simple little mind hack that you can do to overcome imposter syndrome. And uh, one of our... Uh, you know, our prolific contributors and, and community members over the years, uh, Danny with GDG Memphis was just asking, I'm going to quote his question verbatim. It's very well phrased. Uh, with the current times and with mental health being a big subject, how do you deal with imposter syndrome and how do you deal with the doubts that you're facing, especially during the lockdown? And I'll just open that up to anybody who wants to jump in and, and has thoughts on that. It's really long. So I teach like an entire <laughs> workshop on like combating um, imposter syndrome. I'll try to be very brief here. Um, focus on the things that you know. 
you know. Um, imposter syndrome is something that people of all levels of success suffer with, right? Um, what really hit home for me is a, a quote um, from Maya Angelou, who is, you know, just profound and world-renowned. And uh, she was like, yeah, I've written X number of books, something like, you know, 19 books or something and every time I write the next one is when I think that the world is going to figure out I'm a fraud and it's like wow somebody who clearly is an expert um an inspiration to an entire generation feels that you know she's not good enough and she suffers with imposter syndrome as well so um, it really just helped me, like, okay, this is a thing. It's a goofy thing, and um, and we gotta get over it, right? And so, some I'll give you one trick that um I use with people who I know suffer with um imposter syndrome, and it could be like um like just write down, take maybe thirty seconds, um, give yourself thirty seconds to like two minutes, and write down ten things that you're good at. Right. And that timer there is going to help you cheat the imposter syndrome because it doesn't have time to get in your head and talk to talk you out of it. You're just writing it down quickly before you can second guess yourself. And then at the end of that, you look at that and reflect on it. And it's like, wow, I have 10 things that I'm pretty good at. That's that's really great. You know, Um, kick that imposter syndrome out. Yeah, I love that. I want to reiterate what you said about the fact that everyone, regardless of where you are in your career, how much money you make, where you come from, how many followers you have, everyone experiences imposter syndrome. And me personally, I don't think I'll ever get over it. People ask, how do you get over it? I don't think I ever will. Um, But I don't know that that's a bad thing because it keeps me working hard. Um, I will say try to recognize your small wins. If you can recognize all these small things that you do that will compound over time, you'll recognize how far you've come. Um, But I also kind of just want to challenge the question of like, what is an expert? Like there's no definition of what exactly you have to have skill set wise to be considered an expert. Um, And you don't need to be an expert to have valuable information. So, you know, your, your journey is unique and no one will ever walk that same journey as you, which means you are viewing the world and your experiences through a different lens of someone else. So your information and what you're teaching, even if it's been done a thousand times, if you want to teach React hooks, um, do it. Like, absolutely, because the way that you've learned it might resonate with someone else who was struggling with the concept. So I would say, you know, recognize your small wins and just try to realize that everyone feels this way. It's not just you. Can I piggyback on what Emma said real quickly? <laughs> <laughs> on um, owning like your expertise and your your voice is so important. Um, like Emma said, there's going to be dozens of blog posts, tutorials or whatever on a certain topic. And maybe you want to speak on that topic because you just learned about it and you want to write on like, you know, hash note or something like that. Um, and you're like, oh, well, you know, the, the great expert has already written about it. Who am I to write about it? Let me tell you, um, when I'm learning, trying to learn something and think about it from your own point of view, you Google whatever the topic is and you find like a bunch of results and you go to like one of them. Right. And that one's not clicking for you. So you go to the second one and then maybe you go to the third one. Um, There's sometimes it's not until like the fifth or sixth one that I go to that is like, okay, this is speaking to me and how I learn. This is great. The other ones are in a different learning style um, or taught in a different style that doesn't resonate with me as well. Right. So don't be afraid to put out content um, that is already out there. Your voice and your approach is the differentiator. So what other thoughts do you all have as far as uh, just using that confidence that you're getting uh these these same techniques that you're using to overcome imposter syndrome in terms of uh approaching the you know the meta of learning to code and going out and getting new developer jobs and working as a developer uh 
how would you use those same or similar techniques to learning a new topic? For example, it is very common for people to get stressed out about learning new mathematical concepts. Like if you wanted to learn linear algebra, for example, and you wanted to get, uh, it's a very commonly used uh, form of mathematics in software development, especially these days with like all the machine learning uh, tools out there. And, and how would you yourself pump yourself up if you wanted to sit down and like, I'm going to learn some linear algebra this weekend? <laughs> what would your process be? I think you need to find your why. This is another book. I could just open up, you know, a conference to talk about books. Find your why is, uh, start with why, I'm sorry, by Simon Sinek. Um, He talks a lot about the reasoning behind why we do things. If you can sit there and tell yourself, I want to learn linear algebra because it will help me get a job at NASA. I don't know. Maybe that's one of the requirements. Um, As opposed to, I need to learn this it's going to change your mindset. Um, and it's, I get to learn this, right? Like I have the ability to learn this. That's not something everyone gets, you know, has the the privilege or the ability to do. So for me, it wasn't, uh, I have to study for technical interviews. It was, I get the opportunity to interview for an incredible job. And that is my driving force. Great. So, um, I would like to bring a uh, focus on, uh, like, how do you measure success? Like, you have talk, uh, you have spoken about how do you manage your task? Uh, how do you uh, pick books? How do you pick resources? How do you stay motivated? But during this pandemic, since a lot of things are happening at the same time, you are hearing news from presidents. You are hearing news, uh, breaking news from so many different areas. How do you measure your success? Like, how do you measure what you have learned and what you have not learned? And because right now nobody is validating those things you are not attending interviews so how do you measure your success during this pandemic time i take small wins i'm going to focus on uh, the learning piece of it um so starting a course yay me like i i am my biggest cheerleader right um and that helps fight imposter syndrome as well so yay me i started a course Yay me, I finished a chapter and, you know, I got a pretty good result on the quiz there. Um, Yay me, I've actually finished this course. You're going to hear about it on Twitter. Yay, I did it. And then uh, I take it a step further as well, right, because we all know that you can watch a tutorial, but it's especially on coding, but until you actually code yourself, it's really hard to re- uh, retain that information. And so um, then I want to go build something. You know, I'm going to take it a step further. And it doesn't have to be a big, huge app. Just something that's exercising what it is that I learned. And, yep, I'm going to have to go back to that tutorial because some of the things I forgot. I don't quite remember the syntax. I don't beat myself up about that. That's normal, right? We're, I, I'm, I'm new to this. Um, and that's okay. Forgive yourself. Yep, that's why the resources are there. Keep consulting it, right? And it's not just one problem. I might say, okay, now let me do another problem. And after maybe two or three of those, I'm not checking those resources as much anymore. That's a win. I count those small wins all day long. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Oh, Class Central was a side project for me, so it was the same thing I was trying to get better at PHP, and I started it as a side project, a one-page site to list all the courses from Stanford, and I just happened to be at the right place, right time. And for the first two years, uh, it was a side project, and I, and I kept adding new things just for the fun of it, and I'm lucky now it's my job, but I think finding a project, finding some sort of thing that you're passionate about and then building something around it is is a good way to sort of uh, implement what you're learning. Uh, courses sometimes can give you a false sense of uh, learning. So trying to do something that's not following a script of a, a project or that somebody else gave it to you can be a good way to actually test yourself and figure out what you have not learned. Right, right. Yeah. I, um, I just quickly wanted to mention a couple of things. So for me, success is... <clears throat> Success is subjective, um, but for me, success is not a salary or a job title. It's a mindset, and I 
for me, what, I realize I'm successful if I post a piece of content and it helps one person. That makes me feel successful. Um, but just to kind of visualize these things, print out uh, like a, a chart or whatever, and you've got like different values on there. And you, every time you complete a course, for example, you color in a square or something. So I do this when I'm paying off all my medical debt that I still have in the U.S. Like fill in hundred or thousand dollar increments, right? And every time you pay off a thousand dollars, color it in. You can apply that same thing to taking courses or, um, you know, having successful GitHub repos that aren't half alive like all of mine are. Um, and every time you take a course or you uh, close a pull request, like color it in. And those visual reinforcements will, will help you stay motivated. Right. Awesome. So visualizing your learning, it, like mapping it out. Uh, do you all use any sort of tools to build like roadmaps of what you're going to learn or to – how would you organize – okay, let me just ask a very open-ended high-level question, okay? You decide that you need to – that you've always been relatively weak in mathematics. Uh, maybe you got through like the high school stuff and you kind of dodged or took the easier – math courses in university, the, in the easiest required ones, uh, you know, or you didn't even go to university and like basically your math stopped at like high school geometry or trigonometry or something. I mean, if you're in the US, I know in like China, you would learn way more than that by the time you finished high school. But um, let's say that you want to go back and fill in the gaps. How would you just using what you already know about learning lots of about QA uh, or learning a whole lot about, uh, you know, software engineering concepts, uh, learning new programming languages, using what you know from your years and years of actually learning things new on your own and on the job, how would you go about tackling that task? Uh, how would you decide what to do? Let's just start from from day one. You sit down, you decide that you need to learn this new thing. Uh, and we'll just say, like, you need to learn linear algebra, since that's what I mentioned. If you already know linear algebra, don't worry about this. Maybe you can choose a different math this one uh and and we'll go ahead and just start with uh we'll start with emma yeah so first of all i did terribly in math like i basically failed calculus so if you're also bad at math it's fine uh, i just want to throw that out there but um what i like to do is on one piece of printer paper i write down everything that's related i create almost like a graph structure where i'll start with the main topic i'm going to use data structures and algorithms because for me i can talk about that more freely so if I need to learn data structures and algorithms, all right, what data structures do I need? Break that down. Okay, I need to learn things that are already built into JavaScript, arrays, objects, sets, things like that. Well, what other things do I need to learn that aren't built into JavaScript? Um, link lists, uh, you know, hash tables, I don't know, whatever other ones, stacks, queues, and kind of just create a little map of my for myself on one piece of paper. And then based on those things, what are the things I already am confident in? Color those in. Um, and for the things that I need to work on, what resources can I use to learn those? And I create like a playlist. I saw someone in the chat mention Notion. I use Notion all day, every day. I also use the Things app to create different lists, like a to-do application. Um, and between those two, I just kind of keep tabs on the, on the different resources that I would like to watch to fill in those knowledge gaps. Okay, awesome. And, and how would you tackle that, Angie? Yeah, I'll be honest, like sometimes when I'm about to learn something new, I'm not quite sure of um, what's what am I supposed to be learning exactly, right? It's a new concept. I just know, let's say I'm going for a job or something um, and I need to know React, right? Um, given that, all I know is the word React. I don't know anything about it. I don't know. I don't even know how to examine the courses that I could look at to see, okay, what does this course cover versus this course? I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking for. So in um, situations like that, I need to figure out, like, okay, what's the best course for me? What is it that I need to learn here? And with that, I seek out other people, right? Um, you don't have to do this all and figure it out on your own. I'll give you a little tip, though. Don't send people, like, generic questions of, um, hey, I want to learn React. Where should I start? Right, because that could be a really big answer, and people, if they don't know you, might not take the time out to answer those types of things. So try to be like very specific. I need to learn React because I want to do X, Y, and Z. Um, maybe here are two or three courses that I'm considering. Do you have any opinions on you know which one of these would best get me to point B where I'm trying to get to? 
right? So that's a more specific question. Um, so figuring out like, okay, what is it that I even need to learn? Um, finding that course, again, I have to block out the time. Otherwise, the day gets away from me. So um, I'll say, okay, I'm going to take this course. It says that this course is six hours long. Um, okay, where can I squeeze six hours in? And I'm scheduling it out. Like maybe I only have 30 minutes or an hour that I can devote to something a day. So, okay, let me make my little Trello cards with 30 minute slots. Um, I can probably squeeze it in on Monday and then again on Thursday and then maybe, you know, Tuesday or whatever. So figure out um, and be realistic with yourself. Don't try to squeeze in more than you know you have time for. Um, space it out. If it takes you three weeks to get through six hour course, that is okay, you know. Um, you've done it. You've gotten through it versus trying to do six hours in one day, which is not that realistic for a lot of people. Yeah, I awesome. just I want to I want to say plus one to everything Angie just said, 100%. Because like half the time I have no idea where to start, and it's just a dumpster fire. But secondly, um, don't memorize solutions. Understand the concepts, and it's going to take longer to do that. But if you're interviewing, for example, um, if you just memorize solutions but can't under don't understand the underlying foundations, it's going to be nearly impossible for you to explain this to an interviewer. So it, be patient with yourself because understanding concepts takes a lot longer than memorizing, but it will go a lot a long way. Awesome, and I just want to highlight what Jillian Keenan said in chat. Uh, she said, uh, "I think a really good way to determine knowledge gaps is to ask yourself." Can you teach this to someone else? Maybe if you, I mean, there's always the rubber duck method if you're, if you're social distancing completely by yourself. But if you're with your partner or you're, if you've got kids around, you could try to teach them a little bit. And, and uh, you know, there's the saying, I, I can't remember who said it, but it was in my email blast that I sent last week. It says, teaching is learning twice. Um, and, right. you know, you, you figure out the gaps in your own knowledge when you try to teach right. someone else. Uh, right. I want to make sure we get an answer from Dawal though, because I know he's just been. This is what he does. He eats, sleeps, and breathes uh, continuing education. Uh, Dawal, how, how many MOOCs have you completed, by the way? At this point, you think probably a dozen, not too many. So. Okay, yeah, but that's still. I mean, that's like the equivalent of like doing a graduate degree. <laughs> it's like 12, 12 courses, right? Uh, but yeah, yeah, how how would you how would you tackle learning a big, ambiguous new field of study? I think I would try to find a starter course that allows me to put like five to 10 hours and just making sure it's good enough and try to do a speed run through it. Basically understand, like you don't have to understand everything, but just to know what you don't know. And I think that will help you understand. Then from there on, it would help you plan out better. I think we sometimes try to optimize things that we don't even know. So I think just getting started as quickly as possible is something I would uh, try to do instead of, because you can go down the internet rabbit hole for of the best courses, uh, Reddit comments, you know, like everywhere. And then you might actually spend up more time finding a course than uh, doing some sort of a short course that uh, could take a few hours. Right, right. And uh, I would like to bring focus on uh, something that's, uh, happening in the um, internet right now that most of the companies like Coursera and Egghead, they are opening up their courses. They are giving the courses for free. So what are your thoughts on that? Like, do you think this is the right time for developers to grab this opportunity and learn as much as possible? Or should they focus on picking the right topic on these platforms and just completing few? I think definitely picking the right topics. Um... Like places like Free Code Camp always have free content. Um, I run Test Automation University. We have free courses on programming and testing and all the things on uh, development. Um, and yeah, I think it's great that other platforms like Pluralsight and things are opening up their content right now for free. But I wouldn't recommend like, oh, let me start all the things, right? If you have 10 tutorials going, the likelihood of you finishing them all is very small. Um, yeah. Even the likelihood of finishing one probably goes down when you've started so many. Um, figure out what it is that you want to learn. And I'm sure a lot of us have like backlists 
um, of things that we've always wanted to do. And now maybe we have a little bit extra time. Um, and so it feels like we should probably tackle that entire list. No, um, think about like, I don't know, what are you most passionate about or what do you need right away for your current job or your next job or, you know, um, what's just something interesting that you would want to learn and maybe pick one <laughs> and start that. I don't know. Do do any of you do like multiple tutorials in parallel? I, I personally have to do like one at a time. Yeah, don't do it. Um, <laughs> I learned this the hard way. Um, I, t your time and your willpower are de depletable resources. So you need to use them efficiently and effectively. And I'm the kind of person that has shiny object syndrome. Like I see a tutorial, I want to take it and I start it. But what that means is I'm not actually learning the skills that are relevant to me right now. So um, I would definitely recommend sticking with one because human beings like to think we can multitask, but we can't. Great. Yeah, I mean, I would agree to trying to. I, that's why I usually prefer like full courses, which are like almost a month long or something. So once you start something, you don't have to think too much in terms of finding resources. You just do one single curriculum. It's like what it's one storyline. Uh, so hopefully it's coherent. So you're building on top of the knowledge week after week. And th that's why I generally have a preference for university courses. And uh, if I can jump in and just say, like, the reason Free Code Camp is a single linear curriculum is precisely to avoid what Angie and Emma are talking about, shiny object syndrome. Uh, historically, universities just had a single major. Everybody just studied liberal arts. And that was like, you'd learn Greek and you learn Latin, you learn math and you learn all these different topics. But everybody learned the exact same thing. And everybody in the world who went to college essentially learned the same general body of knowledge. And we've gotten away from that with like all these different electives. And it makes sense if you're like learning nursing that you shouldn't have to necessarily learn, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good, <laughs> a good analogy here, but, but you wouldn't necessarily need to learn, uh, a, a lot of different skills if you were going to become a super specialist. But I would argue that we should have a more, generalistic, uh, you know, university experience, and then people can specialize on the job. Uh, but anyway, to, to try to blunt the, uh, the power of shiny object syndrome of grabbing your attention, pulling you away from what you need to do, and ultimately serving as a tool for procrastination. <laughs> we decided very early that pre cooking would have a single linear curriculum and people would work from the top to the bottom and there wouldn't be a bunch of forks in the road uh, because generally when your university is asking you to choose electives, they're, they're basically asking you to <laughs> make a decision in a relatively uninformed way. Um, yeah, I like that Free Code Camp is linear, but it's kind of like a la carte in a sense because you can start anywhere. You don't have to start at the beginning, um, which is really invaluable. Like You have a clear path, but you don't have to follow that path if you don't fit into it. Yeah, and I... I don't want to talk too much about free code camp on this because that's not why you're here. Uh, like everybody watching wants to hear from you all, but I'll, I will say like it's highly informed from like video game design. And I think the future of education, you can see it in video games uh, that, that it's not only fun, but it's almost addictive. <laughs> if we can make learning addictive, then we've truly won. <laughs> and uh, we're truly going to have like a really uh, enlightened uh, populace. So we still have uh, about six minutes, five and a half minutes left. Uh, Fazul, do you, did you have any closing questions that you wanted to ask to the panel? Yeah, I was just going through a Twitter feed and uh, someone um, recently asked one question, uh, which is like really interesting and something we keep on seeing on hash note every time, which is like, uh, my card, uh, like how do you, uh, overcome uh, the, um, that someone else is doing better than you, uh, has learned something really good and has created a really popular open source project and I'm, something, and I'm somebody who is lagging behind. So again, like as Emma has uh, spoken about the self-motivation. So what, what tips do you have for beginners who are feeling this way? I always tell people, beginners, experts, anybody, um, there's a philosophy I follow where 
I think about it as running a race, right? Um, <laughs> and when I'm running my race, I'm looking ahead and focusing on my own path. And yeah, I might glance over to other people who are running, but my focus is on my race, right? And if you stare too hard at other people, think about the momentum that you're losing because you're not focused ahead. And that's true in life. If you're so focused on everyone else's journey, that's time and energy and momentum and self-confidence that you're losing, Focus on your own race. Everyone has different circumstances, right? I'm at home. I don't have kids. Um, my job is very flexible. So I probably can do more than someone else who has five children at home and a partner who is sick and, you know, their fever is running high. And, you know, it's just a lot of different circumstances. Don't focus on other people's journey. You don't really know their story. You don't know how many times that they've fallen down. This might be their third attempt at the thing that this is your first attempt at, right? And maybe that's why they're moving a little fast. It could be a million different reasons. Don't focus on it because you're losing momentum in your own race. Focus on your race. I also right. think, too, this is an important message, which is computers are binary, but humans aren't. And so you're like Angie mentioned, your journey is not going to have feature parity with another person. So focus on who you were, are today and compare that to who you were yesterday. Right. Right, so here's a tip for all the beginner developers. Don't get intimidated by someone else's success. Focus on your own journey. Right. Also, do you really want to quickly, add something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I, know, I know, I don't want to monopolize this, but <laughs> <laughs> someone else's success does not take away from your success. Yeah. So, you know, unless you're applying for the same job, but don't compare yourself to anyone else. <laughs> um, focus on yourself and be genuinely happy for others who are doing well, because again, it doesn't impact your success. Right. Yeah, I think so many people get in this kind of scarcity mindset where they're like feeling like they're competing with other people that are their peers. But the reality is, you know, the world is a big place. I mean, we can't even fathom seven billion people <laughs> like our brains can't capacitate those like that scale of, of numbers. And, uh, you know, nobody understands how everything works. Nobody understands how the market works, how different companies are able to bring in revenue and survive. It's a complex ecosystem. And uh, within all of that ambiguity, you can be assured that there is a tremendous amount of opportunity. Uh, I mean, we've somehow managed for most of modern human history to keep a bulk of people employed. After this pandemic passes, there are going to be new opportunities out there. Uh, and you're not going to be competing head to head with people around you in some abstract way. You'll be competing in the sense that the more entrance into a field, potentially, you know, the, the more uh, supply and demand uh, demand uh, is met and price goes down as a result. But that's only going to have a very small marginal impact on you in practice. All these people uh, that are here in this chat room with you that are watching this video with you, they're your allies and you have so much more to gain from collaborating with them than you have to lose from them also succeeding. I mean, it, it really is true. Like other people's success is your success and celebrating other people's success is a great way to build rapport with them because that's the moment that they really are proud of and that they want other people to jump in. Uh, any closing thoughts before we end this panel? Just, uh, there've been so many great things that you all have said, focus on your own race, your own journey, uh, is something Angie said, and just a minute ago, um, Emma said, your journey is not going to have feature parity with another person. Great great use of uh, software uh, analogy there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we are going to, uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, we're going to take a five to 10 minute break. There are going to be slides playing. There's going to be music from Bass Rebels, which is this great YouTube channel with with uh, copyright free music uh, that we can listen to uh, while and jam out and just chat. Uh, tweet questions for the next panel. The next panel is going to be um, how to work successfully from home without going crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to thank 
are phenomenal guests for everything that they've brought to the table here and that they've shared with us. Angie uh, Jones up in San Francisco. Uh, be sure to scroll down in the description. There Again, there are links to everybody's Twitter. You should absolutely follow Emma. You should absolutely follow Angie and Dalwal. Uh, of course, uh, Emma, thank you for joining us from Germany. Congratulations on your dream job. We're all excited you know, a few weeks after you've settled in, maybe months after you, this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to be learning all the different uh, tacit knowledge associated with working at that company. So that's what you're probably going to be doing. But once that slows down and you have time, we'd love for a check in on the free Cocamp publication. You got uh, it. And, and then uh, Dawal, thank you again for everything you are doing with Class Central. You're taking all these huge, you know, this huge volume of free online courses and you're making it uh, searchable. And you're giving people qualitative feedback on, you know, like you can read the anecdotes from somebody who actually went through the course, what they thought of the course. And then you can see like, it's just like Amazon, like, you know, the star review system. So you can find the best courses for different topics. And of course, Dawal also frequently publishes lists of the best courses based on data. Uh, so thank you, uh, everyone for joining. Basil and I will be right back uh, in about five minutes with a new panel. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for your time. It was nice talking to you all. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Basil. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, everyone. Have a beautiful day. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. <laughs> uh, I'm Quincy Larson with Free Code Camp. Uh, of course, joined by my uh, co MC, Fuzzle, with uh, hashnode.com. And, hey, guys. Uh, hey, Fuzzle. Um, and we. this panel is about how to work productively from home and stay sane and we're going to be talking with three people who probably have a combined total of at least a decade or two of working from home uh tons of wisdom here if you're just starting working from home this is the panel for you you're going to learn all the little tricks and hacks that these people have picked up over mm -hmm. the years uh so i'm going to go ahead and i'm, I'm thrilled to introduce you to our guests uh, these are prominent developers from the community, uh, many of whom uh, I've interviewed on the Free Code Camp podcast, where we publish like videos of their workflows and things like that. So I'll start with uh, Colleen Schnettel, Schnettler, um, and and she is a uh, freelance developer in the Arlington, Virginia area. She has three kids, and she manages to work from home while her three kids are. <laughs> Not like barging in and completely disrupting her all day, which is quite an accomplishment. Uh, we also have Jessica Chan from the Austin area in Texas. Um, and Jessica is the coder coder. You may have heard of her or <laughs> checked out her in incredible Instagram, which is just filled with programming tips. And it's just it, it's one of my favorite Instagrams. I strongly recommend you all check it out. And uh, And then, of course, we have Sid who's in uh, he's in Amsterdam and he works for code sandbox which you may have heard of it's a new relatively new coding playground where you can go and build projects right in the browser um, he was previously at auth zero uh, again both Jessica and Sid have e extensive experience working remotely as well um, so uh, welcome <laughs> thank you uh, yeah so uh, just just to start off, like, what has changed over the past month and a half for each of you? Maybe you could describe how the pandemic is affecting your your day to day life, and and we can we can start with uh, Jessica. Sure. Well, I have been working remotely for maybe the past four years or so, so it's kind of weird because on a day-to-day -day basis, even before this all happened, I wasn't really, I didn't have like a huge active, you know, life outside the house. I would, you know, stay indoors, do my work. And so day-to-day, -day, a lot of things have stayed really the same. But obviously, I think just knowing what's going on in the world right now and, you know, not being able to, say, visit family and friends in person, that's definitely been a huge change. Um, and just kind of moving from in-person meetups with friends to, you know, house party or, you know, different hangouts with friends instead. So it's just kind of moving into the online virtual space like we're doing now. Awesome. Uh, and how about you, Colleen? 
So our lives have been completely upended because of the, the children um, are no longer going to school. And in the state of Virginia, they have canceled school for the rest of the school year. So it's been a month now. Um, my kids are three, six, and eight, and none of them are um, in school. We don't have any childcare options. So it's, I mean, it's been really hard. I've got to be honest. Like it has been, okay, I have a second grader, so he should probably learn something. The kindergartner and the three-year-old, like, they'll be okay. Um, so trying to balance, like, this homeschooling, which I am not a teacher. Um, I've, I've been very, it's been very challenging, that, and, like, still finding the time for work. Yeah, I can only imagine. I, I have two kids, and it's, it's crazy enough. But, yeah, again, they're, they're not school-aged, so we don't have to really worry about teaching them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and Sid, how about you? How, how has uh, COVID-19 impacted your day-to-day -day life out there in Amsterdam? So I'm closer to Jessica on this one, that on the surface, it's kind of the same. Like I was working remotely, the whole team works remotely. But I want to say that it doesn't feel like the usual at all. Like it feels very, very weird. Um, at home, there's been like some tiny changes we had to make because my wife also works at home now. So we've like this. This is the meeting room, and the <laughs> dining table is the co-working space. <laughs> so it's like we can't have like we can't sit at the same place and have meetings at the same time. So we're like constantly booking the conference room. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, it just it feels weird. But like it's my life overall probably hasn't been impacted as much. Right. I don't know about you guys, but do you feel like, like, I feel like just the stress of the whole situation has really impacted my ability to focus too. So there's been kind of third order effects, like checking the news and seeing what's going on and then trying to work. Definitely. Right. right. Yeah. So I've had to push myself back from keeping up to date on the news because it was kind of getting a little too much and you just affecting your mental state. Right. Right. So as you know, like there are a lot of companies who had never heard about work from home concept. So this is like the first time they are introduced to. And I keep getting complaints from um, my colleagues, my friends, and they are saying like none of the work is happening, is actually happening. So things that were supposed to take one day of time, it's like they're taking seven days of time to finish. So what advice do you have for developers who are introduced to work from home environment for the first time? So yeah, uh, Sid, you can go ahead first. Sure. I can start. I kind of feel bad for them because this isn't remote. This is like this is not how remote jobs usually are. So they've kind of been thrown into this without preparation, without being set up for this. Yes. So I have a feeling like, and to be honest, it's not just them. Even remote teams like mine are probably working at like 50% productivity right, right now. So I'd say that's just, kind of the way it is right now because of like the stress and like it's just hard to focus and get things done right. um we can talk about tips soon but i just want to like start by saying like it it would be harsh to like force productivity on anyone at this time and what's been really useful in our team is just kind of having that conversation where like i have a, a lot of guilt about not being productive because that's something I struggled with anyways. So just having that conversation in the team has been has been kind of like comforting because I realize nobody is at their best right now. So people are more forgiving than you would imagine. Right, right. Yeah, I do think it comes down a lot to just your company culture and how maybe empathetic or sympathetic your manager as well as the higher ups your company can be. So I think, you know, this unfortunately might be one of your, these, your miles, your mileage may vary situations. Um, you know, if your company is really understanding and they, they know that, you know, there's parents having to homeschool their kids and there's more understanding in terms of having expectations, but it can be difficult if you're working for a company or a manager who's expecting, you know, the same or maybe even a higher amount of productivity out of you at this current time, which is just not really possible. I just wanted to um, just kind of like, this is a great panel, but I just want to come out and acknowledge the fact that we're all five developers, like everybody here on this call, we're five people who can work from home. And I think it, it, we should, it, it requires saying that we are extremely fortunate in this regard. Many, many people 
uh, cannot work remotely. Like many people have to go and deliver packages or they have to uh, work in a logistics center or they have to work in a hospital uh, to help people who are sick. Uh, many, many things do require physically reporting to a specific location at a specific time and there is a tremendous amount of risk associated with that. And so I just want to make sure everybody watching realizes that we do feel grateful <laughs> for that reality. And, and that uh, I, I don't want anybody to get the impression that we're you know a bunch of entitled developers talking about how our, our productivity has gone down 30% or something like that when people are out there like subjecting themselves to incredible risks, uh, them and their families. Uh, so... Um, this should not be a dour <laughs> panel because we should be extremely happy. I'm, I'm extremely yeah. grateful. Like I, I look at like what I was doing before I was running a school. I was a school director before I learned to code and became a developer. And I had students from all over the world and they would fly in and I'd help with their, their visa paperwork and I'd help with, um, you know, just monitor the, the teaching staff and, and we had in-person instruction. And I think about how that would have completely turned my life upside down. Like I was working like 50, 60 hours a week, just making sure all my teachers were happy, all instruction, you know, all the admin staff were happy. Have you all worked in fields other than software development where working remotely would not be possible? And how do you envision the difference between what life is like right now for you as a developer and what life would be like if you stayed in your old field? Um, so I used to work, uh, in defense and that was a job where we had to go into the office because of the things we did. And, you know, it's interesting you brought this up because I was just saying to my friend the other day, I was saying like, I hate to complain at all about the situation because our situation is better than 90% of the people in the world right now. Um, just because of everything you said, like, I'm so lucky that I made this transition. I mean, at my old job, like, I, I assume we would have lost our jobs. Like they can't pay you if you know if you can't go to work um and just just this even now like because i'm a consultant contractor um i don't know if i'm gonna have a job in three months like i don't know if our current contract our contract was supposed to be renewed but now we're waiting so we don't really know what's going to happen um and that's stressful but my partner also works so between we are so we have that safety net of a dual income household um, but I have so many friends who are independent consultants and contractors where they have one spouse that stays home with the kids and one spouse that works and that anxiety and that stress of like am I going to have a job in three months like I have to support this family like feed these kids is it can be I mean I just feel like it can be overwhelming Yeah, I can I can relate to that a little. So my first job was in a environmental physics setup. So my job was literally to go fill in test and measure stuff on it to see like how much like CO2 in the atmosphere and all of that. This was before like I decided that I don't want to do physics anymore. Uh, but what's interesting is like I can't imagine doing that right now because it's like it, we needed like these giant instruments that were only there in the lab. And it's like you you just can't have that anymore. And like being the most junior person over there, I'm pretty sure I'm the first one that would lose the job. Right? If the labs like labs work on like funding and they have to publish research, and in time like this, there is no research happening. Like you can't publish anything. So if funding gets cut. It's it's the it's the people who put the test tubes that lose their job first. Yeah. Yeah, I, I used to work in um, higher ed in just doing like administrative uh, office type work, and I'd imagine as you know, many schools are either closing, closed, or trying to go online. Like, my job probably would have been eliminated at some point, or would be kind of on the edge. So, yeah, definitely feel very fortunate and. It's a tough situation for a lot of people in terms of their, their work situation. Yeah, and I, I know that many people watching this, many of your jobs may have evaporated. And I just want to emphasize that we uh, we want to do everything we can to help you find a new opportunity. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this, uh, this conference that we're doing will be helpful in that regard. Um, Somebody in, in chat uh, just said he was laid off two weeks ago. Uh, but that uh, the benefit of being a developer 
is that uh, he can take an idea or a problem and he can build something that could potentially replace that income. Uh, so let's talk about work from home tools because that's a huge uh, area of interest right now in terms of like, like if you look at the companies that are hiring right now, many of them like focus on remote productivity like Microsoft Teams or Slack or Zoom or some of these tools. Uh, what is your work from home tool chain like and and how do you stay productive and work with your colleagues remotely? What are the main the main tools you all use? Well, my uh, my work uses Slack for everything. So everyone's on Slack. Even before this all happened, I think they were they have offices in different parts of the world. So they had already kind of had this um, system set up where everyone can communicate pretty well, and everyone sort of knows how to you know, do project management and other things um, on online, which has been pretty great. So I think, yeah, some some chat tool, whether that's Slack or Discord or, you know, maybe even Google Hangouts, I think is super helpful. Yeah, and how about you, Sid? What are you using over at Code Sandbox? Um, so I guess Slack is the common one. Uh, we use Zoom, and we've, we've recently gone through a bunch of pair programming apps. Um, because everyone that we used was having scaling problems, so like our yeah. default choices kind of went went away. Uh, but we've like settled on Tuple dot app, which I think is we new. So maybe it's not as popular. So it's working great for us. That plus Zoom plus Notion, it's I, I feel like it's mostly communication tools, and we're doing a lot of asynchronous communication these days, like a bunch of writing more than we've ever done. I think this has just made us like better at being remote than we were already. Interesting. So just, just to highlight what you just said there, working remotely is is kind of increase everybody's average level of communication skills, you'd say. I mean, we, we were already remote, so we had to communicate a bunch. But then you always had the option that, you know, you could ping someone and you could say, let's, let's chat at this time or let's get on a Zoom call, right? But even though we're like relatively close by, like I think everyone in the team is in Europe, we kind of work in different time zones because somebody has a kid and then they have to, you know, sometimes they have to take the morning while their partner takes the evening. So it's like everyone's schedule has kind of been just thrown off. Uh, so now it's most of the conversations are asynchronous. And I think we've gotten into a good habit of documenting and just like passing on thoughts, processing them and then sharing them. Uh, otherwise, we would just like get on a Zoom call and treat it like a tap on the shoulder. <laughs> yeah. And how about you, Colleen? What kind of tools are you all using? So my teams use Slack and Zoom and Whereby and Google Hangouts if we're feeling lazy. Um, so just just those kind of communication tools. I think because I this one team I'm working with, um, I I agree that this has actually helped us become more communicative which I think has been great for our team. We're, we're more likely to kind of jump on a screen share than we were before this happened, which I'm not ex exactly sure why. Um, but, but that, uh, yeah, so that's worked pretty well for us. Okay, awesome. It sounds like somebody might be washing dishes in the background. <laughs> uh, if, if, if your partner's washing dishes, <laughs> please mute. Uh, so uh, one question we have from... Uh, uh, chat that I really want to highlight. Elliot Sanford, uh, long time free code camp uh, member. I think he's at a coding boot camp right now too. Um, Elliot says, how are you able to cope with being a parent and spouse, but also able to learn and work from home? And what do you do to keep work from taking over? I'm struggling here. So balancing yeah. familial obligations with um, just uh, work in general and the diffuse nature of working from home, I should say. Yeah, I, I mean, we, I'm, I'm struggling with this, right? Because usually my kids are in school. Um, and so it's been a month. We've been on lockdown here for a month. And at first I tried to like set the kids up with their work and work on my laptop by then. But I found that my children are, I guess, too young. They need more focused attention. So for me, it's really about managing my expectations. So part of the reason I'm a contractor, so I have free time to work on side projects. As you mentioned earlier, Quincy, someone said he got laid off and he was gonna start building something. That's amazing. And that's what I do for fun. And I have just accepted the fact that until we're out of lockdown, like I 
just cannot do it. I just don't have time. Like I will lose my sanity if I do it. I mean, you know, I have to let something, you just have to let something go, I think. And so what we do here is I take the kids, except for today, of course, I usually take the kids from 6 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then my partner takes them in the afternoon. And then I supplement work in the night, at, you know, after hours um, as needed. But, but it's hard. And I think, you know, we don't know how long this is going to go on for. So I think it's, it's really important to, although you have to work nights to probably meet your deadlines and continue your learning, like, don't burn yourself out. Um, try to remember to take breaks. Try to, like, block. I think it's about expectation management, too. Like, if you're going to do kids from 6 to 1, like, block out that time for them and just accept you're not going to get any work done during that time. Um, but, I mean, I don't have a great solution. Like, I think, you know, I'm just figuring it out. Yeah. How about you, Jessica? In term, I know, like, yeah. how are you coping with the balance, the work-life balance when work and life are happening in the same space? <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, my husband and I don't have kids, so I think that's one, I think, big difference from my situation. But... I do know that when I first moved from working in a physical office to working remotely, that was like a huge transition. And it honestly, not to like scare people, but it probably took me a year before I felt like comfortable and productive. Um, I was just like, soup. I felt very unproductive. Um, and I felt like during work hours, I would be distracted and I wouldn't really be able to focus on my work. But then I would have to catch up on my work during the evening time when I should be sort of relaxing and getting ready for the next day. So I think kind of what Colleen was saying in terms of time blocking is, you know, even if it's not nine to five hours, try to, when you're working, be 100% working as much as possible, of course. And then when you're not working, try not to let work sort of creep in. Uh, but even if you're catching up on your work, you know, in the evening times, I think you can still at least try to whatever current task you're doing, sort of try to stay focused on that as much as you, as much as possible. Yeah, I can relate to that. So um, I had to learn the same way. Like when I started working, I was either totally unproductive or I was working all the time. So I kind of like juggle between the two before I found a balance. And what's been interesting is that like last month when I, when my wife started working from home, all of that balance kind of went out the window and we had to discover it all over again. And I saw her working all the time and I was like, what do I do? So I also like the options were look at Twitter, look at the news or lose yourself in work. So I think the first three weeks we just worked like all day, all night. Uh, but recently, like we've finally, like it took three weeks to adjust, but I think we've found a balance where uh, we have a few things to work, like we have certain work hours, and then we also know when to call it a day. And that's the funny thing with remote, like you don't see people walking out of the office or you don't like nobody tells you that it's time. So you kind of just have to set a boundary for yourself. And if you're in the flow or if you're dealing with like a bug that you just can't fix and you want to get it done, sometimes you just have to say it's 6 p.m. I did what I could do today. I'm going to try again tomorrow. And one thing that has really helped with this, which which is new to me, like I, I did not do this earlier, but it's new now, which is I found these escapes, right? And it can be like a productive escape, like a side project. So I've started working on a side project. I'm super efficient with that now. Or it could be something which is not so productive, like playing Animal Crossing, right? But just having something to look forward to in the evening, like where you say, like I, people talk about blocking time for work. I started blocking time for not work. So like three hours in the evening, I'm either going to work on my side project or play video game. And because I'm looking forward to that, I'm more motivated to finish my work during the day so that we can, you know, do stuff, do something in the evening. Like we've been so many shows on Netflix and it's, it's fine. <laughs> like that's what helps the rest get done. Exactly. My pet is super happy right now. Uh, I'm spending more time with my cat, uh, taking her to walk. So it's like no lockdown for her, but it's lockdown for me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, developers uh, need to uh, utilize this time that they have got uh, and then they make best use of it and also uh, balance it out between work and, and the home life. Right. Yeah. And Let's talk about time and the temporality of working from home because a lot of 
if you're no longer in an office, you're no longer like how many of your meetings are synchronous where you're all talking like at the same time, uh, where you have like a scheduled meeting, like what percentage of your day would you say is, is actually has to be, uh, tackled at a specific time versus like just an open ended block of time that you could potentially shift to nighttime when your kids are asleep, for example, uh, or other times like, uh, yeah, we'll start with you, uh, Colleen. Like, what percentage of your day is strictly regimented to specific times? Um, very little in terms of my work. Like, we have, um, you know, so most of my coworkers on for this team I'm on now are on the West Coast. Um, so I prefer to, you know, kind of, it, it works better for me to work later hours, but we're completely asynchronous with Slack, so um, I'm totally flexible there. Okay, and how about you, um, Jessica? Most, yeah, most of the communication with my team is probably asynchronous as well, but there are, I do have a few meetings per week where we try to be, it has to be everybody at the same time, but we're in relatively all the same time zones, so it's not too much of a problem. Yeah, and, and Sid, with, um, I mean, how big is the Code Sandbox team? Because I talked to the founder of Code Sandbox like a year or two ago, and it's grown mm -hmm. so much. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so much is relative. I think when you talked was four people, now it's nine. <laughs> We're still a pretty tiny team. Uh, what's been interesting is that we do the we do a daily standup every day. And I've done it since the start, and it's one of those like it's super optional. Oh, I love this. <laughs> this reminds me of the <laughs> super famous kid walk-in. <laughs> Sorry, I knew this was going to happen. That we just moved into a new place, and that door doesn't lock. This, this did, is, did you plant this? this <laughs> thing's oh, Hang on. It's very appropriate. This is what we're all living leg. with right okay. now. Okay. <laughs> this is real life. Yep. Okay, he's going to hang out. He's not going to touch the keyboard or anything. Um, he'll just be here for a few minutes until he's bored. Okay, so um, sorry for the interruption. I, I anticipated that might happen. My wife has been kind of like on standby to prevent that, but the kids are very wily. Um, <laughs> it's very welcome. I've met like my in my team. I've met all the kids, all the pets. Like this is like if a cat comes crawling here, you just let it be. It's fine. <laughs> it's just part of the it's part of your team now. Yeah. Uh, yes, I was talking about the stand up. So we we decided a long back like a while back that we do a daily stand up, and it wasn't so much to sync up on work. It was mostly to see each other's faces, and now more than ever, that's been really useful that I think we've increased our meetings now because it just kind of helps to pair on something. Like I've had so many meetings where we just pair, even if it's like anyone can solve the problem, we would just pair to do it together because it's, like it's like a reminder that we work together. And honestly, it's kind of nice to fade into like API details and not worry about like the, the looming thing in the background of your head. Yeah, and we have a question from the chat for you, Sid. Uh, uh, Leonardo uh, Galante is asking, uh, what is the pair programming tool that you all use currently? Um, so we use Code Sandbox uh, paired with Tuple. Tuple. Okay, cool. And Code Sandbox, of course, I think, it, does it support uh, multiple people editing uh, okay. a sandbox at the same time? Yeah, you can invite someone and then do the dual cursor thingy. Yeah. Yeah. So. Is your whole team remote? Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, there are three people in Amsterdam, but then. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So you're able to dog food your own product. Dog fooding being <laughs> like you eat your own dog food. You're able to use Code Sandbox to work on Code Sandbox. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's so meta. <laughs> It, it gets hard sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what advice do you have for companies who are uh, trying to get used to this work-from-home environment? So as said, you have spoken about stand-ups. So how can companies effectively do stand-ups? Should it be like 15 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour, two hours? Because I have heard companies staying online and coding live. So is that the right thing or what is the right thing here? I, I can start. So yeah. I don't think there's any right or wrong per se, yeah. right? Yeah. Like 
I think like stand ups are great to just get everyone in the room. Uh where stand ups I've seen gone wrong is where you just start trying to solve problems in the stand up itself, right? right. So it's nice to just catch up with everyone, which for us we're like super tiny so it takes 10 minutes. But like depending on how many people in the room, you can go on for like 20 25 minutes. Uh but then what's useful is that you don't try to do things there and instead break out into different rooms. So a lot of times our stand ups end with somebody saying somebody asking the other person to stay back because they have a question for them and everyone else yeah. just says bye and goes away and the two people right. stay on for the call for longer. Yes. How about you Jessica? Um yeah, I mean I think this is one of those questions where the the correct answer is it depends, but you know, I think um yeah, I think just trying to effectively and efficiently run your meetings whether they're in person or online is really important because you know if you have a giant Zoom call with like 25 people I think you may not be able to be as productive as you could if you you know um split up into different rooms um and also right. maybe being mindful of the the amount of bandwidth that's available for Zoom worldwide and other places um so yeah Yeah, and Colleen, did you have anything you wanted to add on this? Oh, right. I believe in overcommunication in this situation. Um now our team has always been remote, but like I I like to I love sit actually I love the idea of a daily 10 minute stand up cuz I'm an extrovert and like I've been in this house for 4 weeks. <laughs> I'm like, talk to me, someone talk to me. <laughs> um so I love that, but uh we're trying to move towards more towards a more communicative model because we've just I mean, we also have a really small team. and the code base is small so we're like stepping on each other's toes sometimes if we don't communicate enough um so i just think it's a situation where you overcommunicate i love the daily stand up idea i'm going to suggest that to the guys i work with and um you know the the slack messages and just just a lot of communication because you're not there you can't go look over someone's shoulder and be like oh you're working on this i'm working on the same thing well that's you know project management so right So how frequently do you think companies should uh, discuss um, their updates with the developers like in a day like is stand up the only thing like Colin like how, what process do you follow in your company like do they meet multiple times in a day or do they meet twice like in the in the morning or and once in the by the end of the day So we don't do daily meetings um yeah. we just do all our communication on Trello and Slack and a call right. like if necessary Um but I like I said I would actually I'm actually going to push to do a little bit more cuz I think it's hard to manage, you know, you guys know like you have GitHub issues, you got Trello yeah. issues, you got Jira, who's who knows where your issues are. So I I think it's better. I mean, I think like maybe even a daily like we don't have a um someone that is just a program manager, so everyone manages their own issues. And so uh, we only have we have maybe like priority issues once a week where we get together and talk about like is the priority still the same coming from the customer um so that's kind of what we've been doing great yeah and as far as uh like physical space so i know you all are working from home uh in some cities people are fortunate enough to be able to have like multi room <laughs> setup so i used to live in san francisco <laughs> and we lived in a uh and and like maybe 700 square feet with uh with the two year with the little baby and it was uh i i can only imagine what it's like to be going through that sort of situation right now during the pandemic hit the pandemic just had the dice rolled differently and the pandemic hit when i was still living in there my life would be very different from being in kind of a texas standard issue house <laughs> but uh but for for those of you who do have you know more than one room or different spaces around the house Do you delegate a specific room for like okay I'm in work mode now uh and how do you go about deciding which space to use for what and do you have any hard and fast rules that you apply <laughs> for that Sure yeah I mean I I also am fortunate to live in a relatively low cost of living part of the country and so I do have a dedicated office which I'm extremely fortunate to have so Yeah, as much as possible I try to limit myself, you know, in the physical space to just do work in the office. So like I'll I'll never do work on my couch or on my bed. Of course, part of that's probably because I have an external monitor that I'm completely addicted to. But, you know, I think it I think it is important to, you know, 
if you're working from home, keep have a dedicated area, even if it's just like your dining table um, during certain parts of the day, dedicated to work. Yeah, that that's been interesting. So, like this room is was used to be my office, and I've I'm the same. Like I've been lucky enough that I was already set up for this, so I didn't have to change much. What's different is that now this is also my wife's office, right? So then we have to take turns. So now the dining table has kind of become the other office, and the couch in this room has become where we have dinner, right? So we've kind of had to repurpose the house. Because it's either the dining table or the bed. And I know I'm not going to get anything done from the bed. <laughs> but like the dining table is the office desk now. And the couch is where we have our dinner. So we have to like change it up a little. But I think like just just defining those spaces was really helpful. Um, because it takes a while. Like it took us two weeks. But now we're, now I sit on the dining table and I know it's the place where I work. And not where I eat food. Uh, right. So that helps me get into the zone as well. Right. So yeah. one question uh, that uh, somebody has asked me on Twitter is, uh, uh, what do you think that companies are uh, actually cautious about their IP being late, uh, their ideas being late? Because as Sid, you said, like you and your wife are working in two different companies. And uh, so the projects that you are working on, so how do you, uh, how do, how should developers manage this? Like, uh, how can they take care of this thing? Because sometimes companies are very cautious about their ideas, their projects that they're currently working on should not be leaked to others. So what do you have to say about that? Are they concerned um, about leaking by like someone talking to their friend about the project or is uh, it more like a security, yes. like a hack type? Uh, no, no, uh, just an idea being discussed with someone else or a person from another company. Yeah, so I guess a lot of discussions might have previously taken place in secure rooms, especially like, yeah. you know, Colleen mentioned she was in defense, and I imagine they have all yeah. kinds of additional layers of security there. But uh, if if you're at home, there could be like an Alexa unit <laughs> that's just passively listening, and we don't know like <laughs> whether that is actually being transcribed somewhere. Uh, same right. thing with like people's phones and stuff, like all the traditional security. When you're on yeah. a meeting, you know things could be said that uh, could be recorded somewhere else, or people could hear about. The, or if you and your spouse are in the same industry, then <laughs> you know competitive information might inadvertently be shared. That uh, you know, so I guess. I'm not sure if this affects any of you all, but uh, do, you, do your companies have any sort of policies or are they even thinking about these things at this point? I, yep. I imagine there are lots of other things they're thinking about. I mean, I I guess it's brave to assume that my wife already doesn't know everything about my work. <laughs> <laughs> like being at home, it doesn't really give an advantage. But I do understand where the question is coming from. So like uh, before this, like a long time ago, I used to work for a healthcare startup. And there were a bunch of rules about uh, personal information, like health data is kind of like very private and stuff. So uh, just for like for checking off all the things in the security audit, we were supposed to have uh, like, what do you call it? Fingerprint scanners in the office and you weren't allowed to take any hardware outside of the office. So there were like a bunch of rules. And I imagine any company that requires you to like log in from a certain terminal, all of that now is up, up in the air, right? You, you work with whatever thing you have at home. And like I, like if I was still at Auth0, maybe they would have a very good answer because they kind of are a security company. But with Code Sandbox, like the more we do in the open, the better it is for us. So I, it's something that I've just like forgotten about. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, let's move to the staying sane part. Uh, of working from home productively because I think it's clear that you all are working productively. It sounds like uh, your things are still getting done. Uh, mo most of you were already working from home before, so it's just the same routine, probably just compressed time. I would imagine with uh, other responsibilities and also, ha I guess one question is like a lot of you have colleagues who weren't working from home, uh, and now they are, and suddenly they're having to rapidly spool up on what you all had already kind of intuited about successfully working from home. What would be your advice to your colleagues? Uh, and have you given any advice to colleagues or, that, who've approached you and said like, oh, I know you work from home. Like, how can I do this 
right? Like, what would be your quick and dirty tips uh, for successfully working from home if a colleague approached you and asked you, Colleen? So I have a lot of tips because <laughs> I feel like Jessica, it took me maybe a year to kind of like figure this out. Um, so I think you have to remember too, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So as we discussed at the beginning of this, your mental and emotional state aren't going to be what they would be otherwise. So you need to be mindful of that. But like practical tips are this, um, you're at home, so you don't have the natural breaks that you would have in an office. So do a Pomodoro timer. Um, you can actually see my yoga mat behind me because I do 25 minutes of work and then five minutes of stretching. Um, and I do that all day. But um, I would recommend that to force breaks, force give your eyes a break, um, just give yourself a little break. I also recommend during that time, do not get on social media because that will distract your brain from whatever you were working on before. So I like to take those five minutes of break time and like I said, like do yoga or you know throw a load of laundry in or something like that. Um, and then the time blocking we talked about earlier, I thought was, um, was really good, that really helps. And then, so what I do, kind of like the office, I also have an office and I use my noise canceling headphones like you guys have on. And that kind of puts me in like the mental work state. Like when I, even though I don't always turn them on, like if they're on my ears, like I know I'm supposed to be working. So I think actually someone in the last chat talked about Atomic Habits, but um, James Clear talks about that in his book as having these habit cues. And so for me, one of my habit cues is noise canceling headphones. So that really helps. Okay, awesome. Noise canceling headphones, Pomodoro technique, um, having something that you can do during that that uh, break time during the Pomodoro to and and staying away from social media during breaks because, who you know, the second you glance at Twitter trending, it's just it's all over. Like you're like, what's that? Oh my gosh, is that really happening? <laughs> is is the real world really this horrible? <laughs> now. Um, how about you, Jessica? What, what would you? How would you advise uh, a colleague who just realized that they have to work from home uh, for the first time? Yeah, I think. I mean, Colleen has some really excellent tips. I think just <clears throat> to add to that, I'd say maybe one is take breaks. Like I try to get out of the house and take a brief walk a couple times a day. Um, obviously, you know, following whatever guidelines are in place for where you live. Um, and I think it's really hard for people who were working in a physical office up till recently um, to feel connected, especially if you're more on the extroverted side. So one thing that I've been doing with colleagues is actually doing Zoom meetings just to kind of catch up. So like we'll do like a virtual coffee break a couple times a week. Um, if any of you have played Jackbox, it's like a game you can play over Zoom relatively easily if you share your screen. It's just like a group game everyone plays um, on their phone. And so it's just kind of a fun way to have a little break in the day, um, kind of get maybe some of that energy, the social energy back. Okay, great. Um, and uh, how about you, Sid? Yeah. So what advice would you have for a colleague? Everything Jessica and Corinne said. Uh, the only thing I'd add is like, I first of all, I really like what Jessica said because it's something that I have started doing too. And it's like, I'm not extroverted, but this is also not my happy place, right? Like even as an introvert, being logged in your house is not what introverts want, right? Like I, I like the choice of going to a party. I just don't like going to parties, right? <laughs> uh, uh, but what I've like, what I've been enjoying, which is new for me is exactly what you said, just calling up your coworkers just to have a chat, which is not about work, right? Just asking them how they're holding up, what are they up to? And just just the fact that we're all doing this together at the same time kind of takes away a lot of guilt that I get for like not being efficient or not working. And I think more than like getting the work done, getting away from the guilt has been really helpful for me. And that kind of motivates me to get back to work. Uh, Practical tips, what I like is like, I'm kind of obsessed with blocking time. So like early in the morning or like the night before I'll plan out what do I want to do the next day? And then in the morning, I'll just have blocks of time. Like this is, this is when I make lunch, right? This is when my meeting is, this is what I try to get done. And then just making sure I have at least a few giant chunks of time where I, I can actually write code uh, is, is kind of crucial for me. And the, the last thing I would add is having like a ritual, almost like a habit thing. 
like we we think that we can hustle our way through this right like we all we lack is motivation to work it it honestly like our brains are stupider than that so we really have to like pull them into it so i really like having like a morning start work routine where it's like i open a notepad i look at my tasks and i just write for 15 minutes and that kind of gets me in the in the headspace to start work instead of you know thinking about twitter or recently thinking about tiktok cuz that's what it has come to and in the evening i i i started by like taking a walk so this was like my pre uh lockdown routine where i would just to end work i would go for a 15 minute walk now that 15 minute has become i just like stretch on or do some exercise on my wife's yoga mat so it's like just having these tiny events or like tiny actions that kind of say like okay this ends my work day and now i'm ready for like the other stuff has kind of been useful to fool my brain into it like stop thinking about work start thinking about your wife now <laughs> right on well one thing that i think we would be remiss not to cover is how is this pandemic going to affect the future of work um how is this experience of social distancing and basically all of us working from home during this period like do you think that people are going to go back to offices everything's just going to go back to normal and snap back the moment that a vaccine comes out and is widely available and we're all safely able to just return to the office like do you think that that is going to happen or do you think that this is going to cause some permanent waves well i think it will cause permanent waves cuz i think without a pandemic generally obviously it depends on the person but working from home is just so much better <laughs> so you know i'm in this social slack group with some friends and one of the guys um is disabled and he's been telling he was telling us like for years he's a web developer for years company w- companies wouldn't hire him cuz they said you can't work remotely and now surprise everyone can work remotely <laughs> So, you know, that's frustrating for him, but he's also he also thinks it's wonderful because he's like the whole disabled uh tech community now has been given more opportunities to work from home, something they were told they couldn't do. Um and I I mean I think for everyone, most people again, remote work is just it's just better. So I think a lot of people are going to push to keep it if they can. And it's cheaper for the company, right? Like office space in Manhattan, you know. <laughs> right many developers are going to realize that they are actually more productive now and uh, hopefully after the lockdown they are going to pre- uh, request their employers to like allow them to work from home yeah i think so i'm kind of like double minded on that cuz i think a lot of developers would like it cuz it kind of takes away the skepticism they had right like i've talked to a bunch right. of friends who said this would never work right? right or they're like no i'm an extrovert i need people around me but now that they're forced into it they were forced to also look at the good sides along with the bad sides so i have a feeling like at least a bunch of developers would want to do it yes i'm also afraid that a lot of like higher ups in the team right would look at this and say we tried remote work it wasn't as productive right That's like this was be, this would be the bad case study yeah uh, where the truth is like right. nobody is productive right so i think i think it it would definitely increase the number of chances so if you're at a company that can go remote i think you'll just there would be more demand for remote work and you can just capitalize on that by all people to work remotely and your folks would like having the choice i think would be the difference yeah so yeah, i have a question sure. for you guys for uh do you guys have people in an office anywhere press both for sit and jessica Are your is your company fully remote cuz I always have I have this theory that if half the people are in the office and you're remote then it's bad for the remote person and I'm wondering if that's true. Right. I think it depends on the company. Um uh, my company is majority in office. So I was okay. working remotely even before. Um I am a minority but um I think that it really depends on the company. They've done just such a great job of making remote remote employees feel on the same level as like the in person. Obviously, you know, we miss out on some of the water cooler chat and some other, you know, talking about projects that might come up, but for the most part, it's been done well. So I think it may depend on the company. Yeah, I can relate to that. So I think it depends on like how how seriously does the company want to take it. 
So at Odd Zero, I was working with a, I want to say 13 hour time difference. Um, like most of my team was in Buenos Aires in Argentina. So even though they were all remote, they were kind of in the same time zone. Um, so what was interesting was the, the team kind of had a rule that if we're having a meeting with one person remote, they'll just go sit in different corners of the office and all join via Zoom. So I think just having, it's like treating everyone as equal was kind of the point. And even if a decision is made in person where, for example, like a lot of time people would meet in the office when I'm just sleeping, but they'll make sure they document it and they put it in a doc where we just like chew on it for a while and comment on it to to get the conversation. So I think a, a lot of it is like, I'm sure a lot of companies are bad when they start and then they learn this through the times and then like just having a mature process around it really helps. Uh, right now at Code Sandbox, we do have an office, which is like, it's it's we call it an office, it's a room in a co-working space, right? So sometimes when we feel like seeing each other's faces, we just end up going there. So like we have three people in Amsterdam, including me. So we end up meeting each other once a week. And then uh, every month, one or two people from around Europe just like flies in to spend some time in, in the office. And that's more of like a social thing than uh, it's like like there are there are coworkers that I've never met in person, which kind of feels weird. So this helps that once in a while you just get to sit next to them and you know, I don't know, look at look that they actually have legs and not just like <laughs> just an insight from chat Jesse Weigel, uh frequent uh YouTube streamer here on the Freeco Game channel and a prolific Dev, he's, he said uh, he often feels that uh, it's difficult to participate in a meeting when he's working remotely and everybody else is in an office. And, and being the remote person is kind of like you're, you're the outsider and there have been studies conducted. I think Stanford did a study of remote work in China and they found that it's harder to get, like you're just as productive as everybody else or maybe more productive because you don't have to spend a lot of time commuting. But uh, you are less likely to be promoted because the work you're doing isn't as visible as the people in the office. So we could talk about this for another hour. Uh, this has been fantastic. I've learned so much. I, I've gotten so much insight. And uh, I, I think it's going to change how I personally work from home, uh, especially a lot of the insights I've gotten you know, from, uh, from Colleen, who's done this for so long. And it's great hearing how, uh, how Sid and how um, Jessica's organizations are approaching this as well. Uh, this is almost a reckoning for everybody who was previously like uh, not working remotely and working with other people remotely. Now there's going to be a lot more empathy, I think, going forward when they're working with colleagues who work from home. Because hey, everybody's going to have had that experience, <laughs> right? It'll be it'll be kind of a permanent uh, memory uh, that uh, will persist and hopefully, you know, make people more empathetic going forward. So. Um, I'm hopeful that that is one silver lining that will come out of this. I just want to thank you all, uh, all three of you, for coming on. It's been phenomenal. Uh, I, as I said, I've learned so much. I've been sharing some insights in chat and over on uh, Twitter. And everybody who's watching this and hears like a, you know, a really compelling thing, like the point Colleen made about uh, people who were previously told they couldn't get a job because they couldn't work remotely because you can't work remotely. If you're, if you have a disability that requires you to stay home, Hey, like <laughs> there's a proof of concept now that work can be done remotely. So therefore, hopefully this is, you know, a huge boon to people in the disabled community who are, who are interested in uh, getting more job opportunities. So yeah, there, there's a silver lining to every cloud, even a cloud is as black as this one. Um, so again, I want to thank you very much, uh, Jessica, Colleen, Sid, everybody scroll down, <laughs> click on their Twitter, follow these people on Twitter. They're fantastic. I don't regret at all following them. I've learned so much from them. And be sure to check out Jessica's uh, fantastic Instagram. Thank you, everybody. We'll be right back in about uh, 10 minutes. Everybody stay tuned and uh, just keep each other company in chat. Cheers. Thank you. We are going to be talking all about the post-coronavirus pandemic uh, developer job market, essentially. Uh, what you need to do to be able to get a job during this pandemic, uh, what your prospects are, uh, how you might want to change your approach, um, and like 
what your odds are, who's actually still hiring, what kind of organizations are likely to grow during this period, uh, where opportunities are going to come from. We're going to be talking about all those things and more, and I am very proud to have gotten three amazing guests who all know quite a bit about this domain. Um, first, Aileen Lerner. Hello. Uh, she is extremely learned, as her last name may suggest. <laughs> Uh, she studied at MIT and is an engineer and a uh, developer, and she also worked as a recruiter. Um, and she was unsatisfied with the way uh, technical recruiting worked, and she founded a company called Interviewing.io, where you can go and you can get uh, interview training, and you can work with real people to get uh, interviewed, and, and you can get a job through there, too. And, and maybe she can share some statistics about like the number of people who have gone through later. But uh, we're, we're thrilled to have you with us, Aileen. Thank you. Thrilled um, to be here. Andrew Brown uh, from Toronto. Uh, and he is a super knowledgeable guy. He's worked as a developer for years and years. And now he runs exampro.co, which is a website where you can go to get uh, comprehensive AWS certification training. And he's been working on getting as many people as possible through these certifications so they can get certified so they can get the many, many cloud engineer jobs that are out there and probably growing as a result of this pandemic. Um, and so, Andrew Brown, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, well, thank you. And Laurence Bradford, uh, you have probably heard her, her, her if you're learning the code. Uh, Learn to code with dot me is her website. It is an amazing website that she she's got a blog she's written a whole lot uh, actually everybody here i'll just say everybody here on this uh panel has published extensively with free code camp so if they're if they seem familiar that may be one of the reasons why alien learner has written extensively about uh the job market and uh the technical interview process and shared tons of data that she's gotten from her platform andrew has created uh at least three i think four major full-length courses that are on free code camp's youtube channel uh, including an AWS for startups, uh, and also uh, th three different AWS certifications. And Laurence has done so many amazing articles on Free Code Camp as well. And she has uh, w one of the longest running programming related podcasts out there. It's the Learn to Code with Me podcast. So uh, if you go into iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts, just search Learn to Code with Me, and you will find her podcast, and she has done 120 episodes. She's she's getting ready to head into, I think, season uh, season seven. Eight? <laughs> season seven, okay. Seven, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so these people are extremely prolific and knowledgeable, and I'm super excited to hear their insights about uh, the evolving job market. So as I started with the other panels, I just want to, uh, it, it is strange to be talking about opportunity uh, in a time of death and despair and disease. And I just want to emphasize that we are aware of all these things. We are not physicians. We're not frontline workers. We're developers. Uh, we're all doing the best we can. We can take as a given that life kind of sucks right now for a whole lot of people. Um, and we can be empathetic about that. At the same time, I'm optimistic that, you know, 12, 18 months from now, there will be a widely available vaccination and life will go back to some semblance of what it was before. And this is a good time for us to be thinking about that and thinking about what the world might look like coming out of that and also figuring out what we can do today uh, to, you know, create a positive influence on tomorrow. So uh, I just want to say that right now, it may seem crass that we're talking very uh, transactionally, very um, bluntly about the developer ecosystem and the, and the job market and all those things when people are out there dying. And I just want to say that um, we we do care about that and we're aware of those things. But we're, gonna, we're not doctors. We're not going to give you any medical advice or anything like that. We're just going to stay focused on what we know. What we know is helping people advance their developer careers. So thank you. With that note, uh, I want to go ahead and kick it off and just uh, ask Aileen, 
how's everything going with you? Uh, how's everything going with uh, the developer job ecosystem in general at a very high level in your in your thinking? Yeah, um, things have changed quickly in some ways, and they've stayed the same in others. So my my whole world is my company, and I'm very heads down in that. But fortunately, what we do is very tied to the subject we're talking about. So I'll just share what we've seen, and hopefully that's useful um, as kind of a microcosm of, of what's going on everywhere, everywhere else in the world. So um, interviewing I.O. does two things. We help people prepare for technical interviews. And then if they do well, regardless of how they look on paper, we actually let them skip a lot of the stuff that happens at the top of the funnel, like applying online or talking to recruiters, and they can like directly book technical interviews with engineers at companies where they might want to work. So what, is, uh, what are the implications of that? Um, on one hand, uh, we've seen a lot more engagement among our existing users, right? So... I think people are home now more than they used to be, which means they don't have to go hide in a conference room to do an interview during the workday. So we're seeing people interviewing a lot more, which also means there's more competition for potentially a smaller number of jobs. I'll get to that in a moment. We've also seen, and I'll just be transparent about this, um, a good chunk of our customers freeze hiring. And it sort of, it kind of came in this sort of... Um, a normal distribution. Like at first it was this trickle, right? And people were like, yeah, we're just going to freeze for a week. Everything's fine. And then, you know, a few days later, no, it's we're going to freeze for like two or three weeks. And then more and more customers came in and started freezing. Um, those tended to be, if, if we were to put a category there, companies that are probably series A and um, earlier. So those companies, I think, are the ones that tend to have... Um, the most uncertainty and the most instability, um, and in some cases, less runway. So, of course, uh, it makes sense that they're being conservative. Um, some of our larger customers, we've seen pick up on hiring. Um, I think, in part, it's a response to the uh, increased inbound applications that they're getting. And in part, I think it's because... Um, uh, unless they're very, very stable, right? Let's say you're a Series B, Series C type company, right? You're probably going to start seeing a little more attrition right now because some portion of your engineers are going to proactively go to the most stable jobs of all, which is probably FANG, right? Facebook, um, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Microsoft potentially. Um, so uh, we, we have seen a shift to, to more people applying there, but we have seen a, a pickup in hiring, especially among um, these sort of larger companies that are doing things that are in some way uh, related to solving the problems the world is facing right now. Maybe it's remote communication, right? Maybe it's healthcare. And healthcare is a very big umbrella that covers a lot of different things. But in general, we've seen that, that space pick up. Um, maybe it's logistics, right? Uh, maybe it's delivery of food. Uh, so there have been these sort of spikes and then there's been a lot of drops. And I think net, if we were to average out the whole thing, there's definitely been a slowdown in hiring. Um, but uh, it doesn't, we were expecting to see maybe, you know, half or more of our customers freeze. And that absolutely has not happened. And our overall interview volume, like how it's, what it's constituted of has shifted, but it actually hasn't dropped very much. Okay, great. Uh, so just to be clear, like the number of, opportunities may have decreased, but it's not nearly as big of a decrease as you might think. Yep. And who knows? I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I basically stopped trying to predict the future, right? Uh, things change so quickly, like in a matter of days, and our strategy has changed like three times internally now. So it's, it's a hard time for us. But um, so far, it's less bad than I think anybody internally thought it would be. Okay, awesome. And uh, Alien, if you could just kind of hold your mic slightly off your shirt, it's just it's oh, pushing your mic, which is creating course. a little bit of clicking. I'm so yeah. sorry. Yeah, no worries. I didn't want to like <laughs> ruin your flow or anything. But yeah, just when <laughs> you're talking, and you can just mute when you're not talking, so you don't have to worry about it. But that's like a frequent thing. I'm sure Laurence has encountered that when she's doing podcasts. <laughs> like the I do, the Apple headphones always had the mic rub against the shirt collar. I get very <laughs> animated. <laughs> also, like if you have jewelry on, I, I do this. Like sometimes it can bang against the table. And I, and I realize it. I'm like, oh, I'm probably being so loud, like right near the microphone. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Laurence, uh, so y you're experiencing this from a from a different perspective. You have tons of friends who are applying for jobs. Uh, what has your experience been like anecdotally? 
Yeah. So my experience is really different because I'm not um, working with directly with people who are applying to different companies. I'm not working with companies who are inter- interviewing candidates, but I've been hearing from friends and also just my own research. Honestly, the last few weeks, I don't, I don't know why, but I've been very into following who's hiring, who's laying off, um, like these shifts in where like people are spending money. The New York Times actually published a really interesting graphic yesterday that showed, it was like this really just bar chart that showed where people are spending less, concerts, uh, restaurants, uh, a few other things that just like aren't really a reality right now when we can't go outside and be in groups. But then it showed this like spike in spending in other areas like delivery services, groceries. I mean, I know personally as a household, we spent twice as much last month on groceries, like going to the grocery store, buying food or delivery stuff than we did the month prior. And I'm so yeah, I've just been fascinated with this shift in like where we're spending money, how we're spending money, the companies laying off, the companies who are hiring more now. And as you said, Quincy, I've had friends who have been laid off or on the other hand, friends that are completely overwhelmed and really stressed out with work right now because they're having the most work that they've ever had in their life. And specifically the two friends I'm thinking of work in like shipping, logistics, e-commerce. Uh, my my like childhood best friend growing up, she she doesn't work in tech, but she works in like shipping logistics for DHL, which is a really big like shipping company. And she has huge clients all around the globe. And she's like, this has been the craziest week. I've been working here for five years and this, or the craziest few weeks has been absolutely insane. But turning the conversation like back towards technology, I've been really following a lot of the news again of the companies that are laying people off, which there are a lot. I feel like if you look at the headlines or you turn on CNN or what have you, Another company is laying people off. Another company is laying people off. But then on the flip side, there are a lot of companies that are increasing hiring. Another friend of mine who used to work at a cannabis startup of sorts, I don't know exactly what they did, but I know she got laid off. And I know she very quickly got an interview at a uh, life insurance company because it's not really shocking, but life insurance sales, I think they've doubled or something since all the coronavirus stuff has been happening. So there are these industries that maybe isn't talked about as much that are seeing an increase in demand because of all of this. Um, and as you said in the, in the beginning, Quincy, like it is really unfortunate that so many companies are going under or laying people off. And then there are like these winners and losers, but it just is the, I don't know the way it is right now. Yeah. And Andrew, what's your experience? You're, you're coming to us from, uh, north of the border uh, yeah i can yeah. give you the i can give you the canadian experience and i do know a little bit that's going on uh to our, our our friends to the south um and i would i would agree with laurence um there are industries that are uh, definitely taking off and ones that aren't i can specifically say like if, if you're looking at ed tech med tech or stream tech uh those ones we're seeing uh th- that they're uh that they're thriving because they're, they're going virtual or you know it's direct to the pandemic or the fact that everybody has to uh, now uh, work virtually. Um, other industries that uh, the technical demand is growing, I wouldn't say they're thriving, but the, the demand is there is insure tech. So Laurence just mentioned that, that's a really good uh, point. And delivery tech, that's another one, right? How to get stuff to people or logistics. Uh, so you know, if you are looking for a job, uh, you know, uh, consider looking at those industries and trying to um, tailor, tailor your resume or tailor your skills for these industries in the short term, uh, because that, I think that's gonna help you. Um, to talk specifically about the roles uh, that we're seeing that uh, people are getting laid off for. Um, for those who don't know, like, um, you know, I wasn't just a developer. I was a CTO um, for multiple startups prior. And so I'm very fortunate to be part of a network of CTOs in Canada. And so when people say that, um, that uh, companies are laying them off, I literally see the CTOs in a Slack group saying, I had to lay off these people. Uh, and then what they're doing is they are trying to um, uh, uh, mitigate that by helping um, uh, or finding other companies to help hire these people back, okay? Um, but to, to talk specifically about the actual roles where I'm seeing um, uh, that are being deprioritized and the ones that are now uh, scaling up on, uh, I actually made a little list here. So there's there's uh, what I'm being seen for people getting le- uh, let go for is sales and business development, digital marketing, UX and web design, uh, in some cases, uh, 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 data analysis. Uh, and that's why so I, I like to think of it as that there's growth aesthetics and, uh, and uh, analysis, which are being cut down on 
because that's really when you're focusing on the growth of your business. And right now people are being more conservative. And so they're looking uh, more for security, reliability and support. And for those kind of roles, we're seeing a huge increase in, in uh, a general technologist. If we're talking about from the cloud perspective, that's called a solution architect. Uh, project management is very important. Uh, cloud engineer, so that's a hybrid between web developer and cloud skills. Virtual assistants. I even have to get a, a virtual assistant because the increase in this um, this market has been uh, uh, crazy. Um, social media support. So we might have seen a decrease in people doing sales and marketing, but we're seeing an increase in support uh, for uh, existing users uh, and, and that stuff like that. Data engineers, so we saw a drop with um, uh, uh, data analysis, but we're seeing now data engineers will become more popular. Site reliability officer, that's someone that makes sure that the platform is running uh, uh, stable. And security engineers, so you know, listen to that uh, that list I gave you. I might share it uh, later on into the Free Code Camp Discord as a as a conversation after after there. If you want to know a little bit more about those roles, but that is my take on it, and that's me looking at these lists that are coming in, who's getting laid off, and that stuff. And by the way, uh, these lists are actually public. Um, I just don't feel like they're publicized very well. And so I was able to grab those links, and I have a list of lists of places that are are, are hiring, and a list of lists that are, are layoffs. And you can go through there, and you can see what's being hired for and what's not. And there's another list of, of, of people that are getting, uh, that are looking for work, right? It's called the helpless.ca. Um, and I, I think there's other countries doing it. I just know I just know the Canadian space. Um, uh, but I'll, but you know, look at those lists, and and you can even get a feel of you know how you can align to that market to get a job. Uh, so you know, there I think that's a a, a bit for now. So <laughs> I'll take yeah. I mean, that in the back sounds to you, sir. fantastic, and it, it sounds like you have the making of like a big, you know, like a, a major article, like or maybe even oh. a regular article, like hey. Here, like this this week's update uh, during the uh, uh, pandemic pandemic job status. Update yeah, anyway, like any, that, any way I could help. I'd love to write an yeah. article. It's just it's people just have to ask me, right? So yeah, right. yeah. Well, right. consider this a request for an. There article. you go. Yes. Then you get then and, you'll and, get an article. And and yeah. Laurence, I know you you've also been trying to uh, assemble as much information as you can and get it out there in the hands of people as far as like uh, I mean we could we could absolutely run like some sort of survey or something I should actually put together a survey for <laughs> this conference sorry I didn't think about that until now uh, but I will I'll get that together and I'll shoot that link out through Twitter so just follow the lockdown conf hashtag and look for a post conference survey a lot of people are watching live right now we're getting some questions I'll go to those in a moment thank you everybody for asking your questions please just pile all your questions in there uh we've got experts for the next uh 30 minutes or so and we want to get as many other questions to them as as we can uh yep. and then a huge number of people probably like 90 percent of the people who are going to watch this are going to watch this after the stream ends and just watch the uh you know the the edited version where we're going to edit out the breaks and everything but um so uh i have a very very quick um question that I think uh, I, I want to ask to my co-MC um, how are things going in Bangalore and what's the Indian experience like because India is a massive country with tons of tech companies and I just heard that the uh, lockdown was further extended today yeah 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 the lockdown has been extended uh, yeah the lockdown has been extended till May 3rd uh, we just got the news uh, from the Prime Minister this morning and uh, uh, the companies are taking it slow here, uh, from what I have heard. Um, most of the companies, uh, like food delivery companies and uh, uh, hyper-local markets and all those companies have reduced the number of hiring here at the, at the, uh, in the current time. And most of the uh, uh, hiring that are going on, as Andrew said, are on the non-technical uh, jobs right now. So. So yeah, um, it, it's uh, it, it hasn't impacted um, like some anything different from the rest of the world. Okay, great. And uh, uh, this question comes from the audience uh, from Elliot Sanford, who, as I mentioned earlier, we had a question from him. Uh, he is a boot camp student, and mm. he's getting ready to graduate. It's kind of like the university graduate in 2008, right? Like coming out to a, a fairly tepid job market or relatively tepid market. Um, coming out of a coding bootcamp in 2020, uh, 
what would be uh, his, his question is how should I as a boot camper near graduation combat negativity and what things can I do to compete against the more experienced developers in the hiring pool? Uh, I'll start. Great. Yeah. Um, so there are two things that make coming out of a boot camp really hard. And I think these things were always hard, even in a great market, and they're going to be extra hard now. So the first thing is even getting your foot in the door. So as you probably know, there is a somewhat potentially unfair bias against boot camp grads. Um, and what makes it even harder now is that one of the other groups that we haven't talked about who's experiencing heavy layoffs is recruiters. So recruiters are getting laid off like crazy, which means that a company that previously potentially had a whole team dealing with junior hiring might now have just a handful of people that are scattered between sales recruiting, ops recruiting, um, and engineering recruiting, and some of them might not be domain experts in those fields because they're just being grabbed, and, and that's what they're doing now. Um, so it's even more important now than it ever was before to find a way to get noticed and stand out. And if you apply online, and I've said this before about applying online, even in the best situations, it's kind of like screaming into a black hole. Like the, the abyss will probably not answer you. Uh, so if you can, um, just bypass recruiting entirely. Find an engineer that works at that company. Find somebody, even if you don't know them, maybe they wrote a blog post about something you're interested in. Just get on Hacker News, get on the company blog, get on LinkedIn, make a list of engineers that work there that you have something smart you can say to or something that you uh, can talk about a shared interest. You know, maybe, maybe you know somebody in common and just treat it like a sales job. So pretend you're a sales development representative and you have a funnel and it's your job to just reach out to engineers at a bunch of companies that you want to work and to each one say something that doesn't just say, hey, I graduated from a boot camp and I'm looking for a job. Talk about something they've done you're interested in. Talk about something you've done that is related to the subject matter. And you're going to get a lot of, um, you're not even going to get rejections. Most people will just ignore you. But this will probably improve your odds of getting noticed by an order of magnitude, if not more. So that's the first thing. The second thing that makes graduating from a boot camp really hard is being prepared for technical interviews. Now, different companies interview differently. Not everybody does full-on algorithmic interviews, but depending on where you're applying, chances are they do, and you can probably find out. One of my personal biggest pet peeves with, I think, every boot camp under the sun is that they do not do an adequate job of preparing you for this, and they also de-emphasize how important it is. So I would get on starting your funnel, doing all your outreach to everybody to get your foot in the door. And in parallel, I would start um, heavily preparing for technical interviews. Code Camp has a uh, free Code Camp has a lot of resources. Of course, my company does this, so we'll encourage you to go to interviewing IO. But there are books there. There, there are a ton of resources out there. Um, and I would spend weeks if not months and I'm sorry this this is going to sound discouraging but weeks if not months working algorithmic problems uh, understanding data structures and filling in those gaps that your boot camp probably left in your education it's going to be hard but if you kind of embrace the idea that it's going to be hard and make peace with it you'll be successful just sort of say it's going to take three months for me to find a job maybe more I'm okay with it and in the meantime, I'm going to go heads down and focus on these two things. Cool. Awesome advice. And I'm actually typing up verbatim a quote that you just said, Aileen. Uh, so, uh, Andrew, did you want to talk about this a little bit too? Oh, Your yeah. I, yeah, points? I would love to talk about it. So, in, uh, so for those who don't know, I'm in the, tr uh, the greater Toronto area. And I actually do a lot of mentorship with boot camp grads uh, from a, a variety of different ones here. So we have General Assembly. Uh, Lighthouse Labs, uh, We Cloud Data, um, and Juno. And so there is a bit of a difficulty getting the job at the tail end there. Um, the career services for every boot camp is different. Some are some give you a lot of support afterwards. Um, some uh, put it on you to to do that effort. But I can give you a couple of hacks of what you can do to try to get a job in the market. Um, and so there's there's two ways. We can we can take the friendly way or we can do the cold call way. And so the, let's talk about the cold call way. Um, and this is my approach. And I could do this today and get a job uh, in a week. And so, so this is what I would do. 
I would go to AngelList. Uh, I can't remember if it's .say or whatever the or .io. I feel like it's a .io. But if you look up AngelList, it has all the startups uh, in the world uh, per country. So I would say, okay, what's my closest uh, tech hub? It's Toronto. Or what's in my time zone? Uh, as long as it's my time zone or near me, that's great. I'm going to sort by the greenest. Greenest meaning the newest startups on the market. I'm going to go down the list. And I'm going to try to guess who is uh, near raising money to get uh, their, 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 it depends on what kind of risk you want to take, but if, you're, if they're close to getting their seed or their series A, I'm going to find those green companies. I'm going to look at them and say, um, what do they do and what impact can I make on their company? And uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach out with them and I'm actually going to build them something and I'm just going to ship it to them. Because if you show up and hand with some, uh, something, uh, it's very hard for people to say no. If you can guess what it is that's going to really help them, uh, it's, it's very unlikely they will, will turn you away. But I think it's a better method than applying to 30, 40 places. If you, uh, it's better to build 10 apps that are for very specific industries. And then you get to keep those apps. And also, um, it, you get faster and faster building applications. So if you, say, if you think it takes a lot, a, a lot of time, that is the number one thing I find uh, bootcamp grads coming out of their curriculum is that they do not have the, the technical speed. Um, so they might have the skill, but they don't have the speed. And so you should be able to build out uh, small applications, whether it's uh, five or 10 in a week and ship those things out and you'll get a, a, a much greater response. Uh, and the thing is, people are always worried about giving those away for free. Uh, the reason I'm not worried about doing it is that um, if somebody wants to utilize it, they need the person that built it to maintain it and you have them on the hook. So they're going to want to uh, uh, bring you in the door for that. You've really thought about what the problem is for the business owner. And a lot of startups just do not post their jobs online because they do not have time or uh, there's su such a small team. It's just like they feel like they're wasting their time. So they're going to wait till they get to a certain growth before they post that stuff out. And by taking that initiative, that is a great way uh, to uh, get your foot in the door and also to uh, get a role that you normally wouldn't be able to get and then quickly move up the ladder. Okay, so that is the cold call way. The other way is the friendly way, and I find this works for um, medium to large companies. Uh, and uh, the idea is that you want to become friends with whoever it is uh, uh, that works at that company. So if you want to work at AWS, you better go on LinkedIn, you better add everybody you know that works at AWS. Um, and, and, and be authentic and, and try to be as helpful as you can and document your journey that is parallel to this company. And uh, you know, hopefully what they'll do is they'll take notice of, uh, uh, of it, They'll like your stuff. I never tell people to go message people directly on LinkedIn. I say, go add somebody. Uh, you don't have to message them. And then just if uh, they'll see, if you're active, they'll see you in their stream. If, if they're interacting with you, that means they're aware of your content. And then you can go reach out. Or you can go on LinkedIn and say, boy, I wish I had a job like this. And those people have already seen it. And then they'll reach out to you. Um, and, and that's the friendly Canadian way uh, to get a job. I don't know if it works everywhere, but it definitely works really well here. Uh, so those are my two hacks for you. One thing I'll, I'll quickly add, if that's okay. Oh, sure. I strongly advise not messaging engineers on LinkedIn or adding them on LinkedIn because they're not, they, they hate it because all they ever get there is recruiter spam, right? So, so oh, sorry. So I would say that in context, it depends what it is. So if you want to add engineers, just add them. If your profile looks, and by the way, I have an article, I think called LinkedIn for Losers. I don't know why I named it that, but because it's, it's like LL. But I, I, I agree with you. I think you're right. I, I get so much spam. It drives me crazy. But if you just add somebody, what they're going to do is they're going to look at your LinkedIn profile. And they're going to say, what is this person's motivation? What? Why do they want to connect with, with me? And if you look like that you just, you're just you interested in the same space and you're going to share cool content and you're not going to be like like spamming that person, trying to get a job, then they're going to add you. And then down the road, when you build up that friendship, then you can message them or, or do that subtle thing saying, oh, boy, I wish I could work here. Yeah, um, I guess both approaches can work. I, in my experience, I found that just figuring out somebody's email address and writing them a highly personalized email that touches on something they've done before and something you're interested in is much more effective. But I, uh, I have not tried uh, sort of the add me and then I'm going to post interesting Well, I'll tell, you the, I'll tell you the other day, I got an email from uh, somebody and, and they sent me a really long email and it was great. But uh, it was so long, and especially like when you're uh, like a developer, you're busy, you don't have time to re read long emails, and your brain just turns off. So if you do want to take that approach, make sure it's concise. But the only reason I stuck with that email was because the person who sent me the email, their profile was, was Star Trek themed. So they said, <laughs> so that is a big long thing, and I'm, going, I'm reading this going, 
oh man, they're just trying to they're just trying to like uh, 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 game me, you know, like trying to trying to uh, uh, build that relationship really fast. Um, but they, they had that that uh, personal bias, uh, and that that got them a personal response back from me. I wouldn't say uh, that always works every single time, but it just that time it worked. So yeah, personalization is key. I've gotten so many emails where people just rehash everything they've ever done, and it just reads like a generic cover letter. I get dozens of those a day, and I tend to ignore them. If I would it's say, yeah. I would say, oh, sorry about that. I would say, um, I would say that it, it's not just being personable; it's being authentic. And I think as of humans, course. we can tell when something is off. So, so even if you think you're being personable, it's like we know you're up to something, right? Oh, so, personal. So something that touches on something you've done, something I've done, something that. Uh, not just friendly, but something that that draws on a shared interest or or something useful that isn't just networking. I think well, we're saying the same thing. Oh, you don't know for, for certainly. I'm just I'm just trying to to iterate that it, uh, being personable is not the same thing as being authentic. Totally. And I and I think that you know you can be personable, but we're like okay, great, but we see that there is an agenda behind it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I get just to interrupt. Like I get a lot of emails, uh, and a lot of them address me as sir, like sir. And, oh, yeah? and I immediately know, okay, this person's probably asking for something if they're calling me sir right off the bat, if that's how they address me. Uh, and also, if I get an email from you and it's in a f like non-plain text font, <laughs> I'm just going to automatically archive it. Like I won't read it because the quality of the emails that I get that are not in like just the standard text that have some sort of formatting on them is always very low. Uh, so yeah. it's just like pattern recognition. Don't use funky fonts. Don't use like a lengthy signature. Um, those kinds of things are tells that uh, you're not be a human. Savvy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, I had one thing. Oh, real quick yeah. about oh, please, um, that for the boot camp grad. So I think both of your answers were fantastic. And I always tell people like it's never too early to start practicing for a technical interview. Like yeah, months in advance, like even if you're not even thinking about getting a tech job yet, um, pandemic or not, like start practicing for those technical interview questions for sure. Super important. That can like literally make or break your opportunity of getting a tech job and competing with other people who do have computer science degrees. However, if you're a coding bootcamp graduate or soon to be, or someone else looking to get a job in tech, and you're feeling a lot of pressure because it's like, wow, I'm going into the job market in like the worst possible time. Like literally, when was the last time you had a major pandemic like this affecting our lives? Like, I don't know, like a, like what this, uh, 1918 or something? Yeah, so, years ago. Yeah so, yeah. yeah, so like give yourself some grace. Like, like realize that these are crazy unforeseen circumstances. And if you're in a situation where you need a job to support yourself or your family, it is completely okay to have a temporary job plan. Even if you did just go to this coding boot camp, even if you did just graduate uh, from a degree with, or a school with computer science degree, uh, of course, go after those positions, but do something else in the meantime to make ends meet. And there are companies like I know Instacart is doubling their customer support um, staff by the end of May. So I think they have 1,200 now and they're going to be uh, going up to 3,000 like, but yeah, by the end of May, so like six weeks or something. Maybe a customer support role at Instacart isn't your dream job, but nonetheless, I think it could even be a step in the right direction depending on what industry you're coming into because Instacart is still a tech company. Uh, maybe you, you know, again, maybe it's not exactly what you want, but it could be the step there. You could get your foot in the door at that company, or maybe you could leverage that experience in the future to get a job at another delivery company of sorts, but as a junior developer. So give yourself right. some grace. This is a really hard time right now. And like, just take that in as you, you know, go about your job search. I would like to bring to this um, something to the focus here. Like, mm -hmm. what advice do you have for developers who are planning to uh, land a job uh, in companies like Facebook and Google? Because today morning, uh, uh, Cheryl from Facebook announced that they are going to hire 10,000 people in engineering and product by the end of the year. So what advice do you have for developers to uh, apply for these companies and also crack those jobs? 
For oh, I I actually am not sure if I would be the best to answer this because a lot of my experience is like at startups and whatnot. But I did see this statistic you're talking about as far as yeah. um, Facebook plan to hire ten thousand more developers, which is like literally five times the size of my college. That's like a town <laughs> of how many developers that they're hiring. I know they have a lot of employees though, but I feel like Eileen, maybe you'd be better at answering that and like approaching um, yeah. a big tech company mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, I mean, my uh, my advice is not going to be that different for those companies than than for other groups. Again, um, right now those companies are getting hit really, really hard because everybody views them as a stable place to work, right? So uh, they are some of the only ones that are advertising loudly that they're hiring during this time. They also pay more. Um, so even even in an easy easy economy, it's hard to get noticed, and here it's going to be even harder. So um, if you can, try to get a referral in. Try to, um, chances are, uh, a lot of, um, one thing that people don't know about recruiters at these companies is that most recruiters are contractors. And I'll explain why I'm talking about this in a moment. So um, what can happen sometimes is you get reached out to by a recruiter if you're fortunate enough for that to happen. And then by the time you see it, maybe you missed it, Um, You reach back out to them and they're no longer there. These people are usually contractors that work at these companies for six month stints and then they move on to the next place. Um, So again, I would try to forge a genuine, authentic relationship with an engineer at one of these companies, maybe an engineering manager, maybe think about which teams um, might be hiring more than others. You'll still have to go through that like centralized interview process, but at least you'll have somebody um, put your hat into the ring. Um, so that's, that's one. I know that's not super useful advice. The fact is like, it's really, really hard and it's going to get even harder. But if you are fortunate enough to get in, and this is, um, extra important interviews at these companies are very, very difficult and they tend to follow a very, very specific pattern. And you really only get one shot. One, one piece of data that we've seen on our platform over and over is that the same engineer, can do very, very well in a technical interview one day, and then the next day, absolutely bomb, even if those interviews are of comparable difficulty with engineers who are comparably strict. It's because the interview process is just fundamentally non-deterministic, and there's just so much room for error. The best thing you can do once you get your foot in the door is to spend even longer than I advised before preparing for interviews, so that when you do get your opportunity, Um, you don't screw it up. Here's another thing that I've seen a lot of people do wrong. Um, Sometimes somebody is so happy that they finally hear from one of these big companies that the recruiter who's in, I mean, recruiters are incentivized to make hires as quickly as possible because they're compensated on it. And they're, they're uh, generally, uh, that's like their, um, their bar for performance. That doesn't mean that you have to interview immediately. If Facebook reaches out to you, they get back to you and they say, okay, great, get on the phone with a Facebook engineer next week. If you're not ready, just push it out and they're going to be okay with it. Don't panic. Don't say, okay, this is my only chance. I'm just going to cram the night before. It's gonna, if you've never done these kinds of interviews, it will take you months. So accept that, push your interview off, schedule it a few months out, and then spend hours a day preparing. So I might be able to touch a bit on the uh, like Fang or large companies there. So um, uh, one of my friends, he wanted to uh, work at Google. Well, I don't know if he wanted to work at Google, but what he did was uh, he was reached out from uh, uh, from uh, recruiters uh, within Google, and he went all the way. He went all the way, and they uh, offered him the job, and then he said no. So he, he didn't really want the job. He he loved the challenge, and now he he makes uh, video games. And he lives on an island. Uh, and but the thing the thing about that uh, is that he's uh, they said okay well who should we uh, who should we hire since you're so great who can you recommend and then they reached out to me and so I was going through the process and then I did the same thing I went yeah you know what I, I'm having fun doing this but really I'm not going to see it to the end so I'm going to stop here and they and they went to me and said who can you recommend so um, you know if you if if you know any friends who've gone through the process. Um, or or make friends with other people that are are going through it because maybe they can pass you along, and and the process is very uh, 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 random. So like I was going really uh, really well through Google, I cannot get hired at AWS to save my life, and it makes no sense because everybody around me, even people work at AWS, says you are qualified. Um, the process is crazy. I've had like senior uh, senior develop, developer advocates re- uh, reach out to me and, and say to me, you know, I had to apply five times. To, to work uh, to work here before I got in, 
So you just have to take your bumps and realize that it's going to be uh, a very difficult process. Um, I can say that you know for any of these companies, uh, sys- uh, well, it depends for the job, but um, systems design is a very important thing. So understanding how to build a complex systems. So uh, or looking uh, for a systems design engineer, if you Google those terms, um, uh, those might help you understand conceptually how to put things together. And obviously, there's uh, algorithmic challenges, interview preparation. If you could find any good services for that, that would be great too. Um, you know, and so that's just my two cents on uh, on that part. Uh, just one more thing to add there. Um, if you are from India and you're coming to Canada, last year um, we started fast tracking um, uh, visas to India because we really want more talent here. Um, so so there's a lot of opportunities uh, there as well. Um, if you want to work at a big company, but not necessarily one of the FANG companies, uh, there's uh, good recruiters like uh, VanHack. I always hear really good things about them. And you might think that right now there's no opportunities because there's no way to uh, there's no way to uh, bring people actually into Canada. Um, but th- what what's happening is that these companies are hiring the remote and they're waiting for everything to blow over and then they bring them into Canada. So we're not seeing a, a drop uh, drop in there. Uh, if uh, if you want to get into cloud, Jefferson Frank is a really really good recruiter. Um, if you want to get in, into uh, data science roles or anything data in Canada, WeCareer is really really good. They're not a recruiter, but they they know a lot of companies uh, that can uh, get you placed. Um, and those those are those three recruiters that I like. Generally, I don't have a good relationship with recruiters, um, so I do like to mention the ones that um, I feel that uh, do care about you and are trying to do a good job, and they're the ones that are working on contract and they're trying to push every person every applicant. Uh, into that into that uh, that box, you know. Laurence, uh, do you have any friends who are applying for like large, you know, the, we say Fang, but that could also include, you know, Shopify, could include Infosys and Microsoft and a lot of other big companies that are actively applying. Not that I know of. Um, I feel like a lot of the people that. I'm around either, well, actually, honestly, don't work in tech because I grew up, I was not in tech at all, right? So a lot of my friends from college and before that are not in tech Uh, or like startups. Like my husband um, just, like we met actually at the last startup that we worked at and now he just started his new startup. I do this. Um, So a lot of like the people that were kind of around a lot of the time are more so in the startup world. But I have been reached out by or I have been reached out to from recruiters from Google, definitely. And um, one of the things that you were saying, Andrew, in your example, I know that at least one of the people, it was because someone else I know that he was working at YouTube, he gave her my information because I also do think, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but say if I did end up working there, he would get a referral, he would get like a bonus, right? Yes. So like they really incentivize employees for good people. Yes. Yeah. Or, I, I, I'm not sure if it, it's the same with candidates as well, but yes. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. But yeah, for the people who work there, it's like good. So they a lot of times will like share qualified people that they know of to the recruiters that work at those companies. So, yeah, but yeah. Well, so there's a pretty big gulf because a lot of people are in kind of startup land and other people are in like big company land like they're, they've kind of got their sights set on working for a big known company. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Aline, what would be your advice to somebody? Cause we already heard a little bit from Andrew about applying to smaller startups. Uh, but what, how would you vary your approach if you were going to go on the job market today as a developer and you wanted to work at like a small upcoming, uh, company, like for example, code sandbox, uh, Sid from code sandbox was on the previous one and they're, they're growing. They're still very small. It's like, I think you said like nine people, maybe a company that has closer to like 50 people. Like how would your approach be different there than applying to a Microsoft or an Amazon? Yeah. uh, Depending on the company size, let's say it's under 20. I would probably reach out directly to a founder uh, and ideally the CTO, right? Um, That person is the one that has the most leeway to make exceptions. Companies of that size are typically biased against hiring junior talent because uh, when you're that small, you don't always have the luxury of thinking months, years ahead. You're often kind of thinking uh, just a couple months ahead. Uh, And that means that you may not have the bandwidth to train somebody up. And depending on the constitution of your team, you may not have the mentorship ability 
to get somebody from A to B, right? But rules are meant to be broken. Um, People that are not the founder will probably be more risk averse about breaking those rules because everybody has some amount of social capital at a company or, and you use it, you like you get a few shots, right? And you, you try to spend it on things that are going to have the best outcome. But if you're a founder, you can do all sorts of crazy shit, right? <laughs> so um, I, would, I would probably reach out to a founder and um, you know, write the best, most concise most authentic email that I can if I can get an introduction to them even better. Understand that founders are very, very busy. They're probably not spending more than a few seconds on any email. So just say in the first two sentences who, uh, what you want and then explain why you deserve it. And that's the whole email, right? Maybe link to some things if you've done cool stuff. Uh, for a slightly bigger company um, who probably is hiring juniors because they do have that mentorship bandwidth and the ability to think ahead more um, you may want to reach out to, say, a director of engineering. Um, sometimes uh, you get lucky and you find stuff they've written about hiring. And if you can find something they've written about hiring and reference that and, of course, um, tell a compelling story about how hiring you fits into their worldview and thesis, that's a win. They will definitely, they might not hire you, but they will at least answer you. And once you have your foot in the door, then it's just on you to, to show that you're capable. Um but, you know, uh, in, in this climate, if you have a limited amount of time, and I would probably not spend it on applying to very small companies because they're dropping like flies. All right. <laughs> well, that um, yeah, was that, some really good advice. Just, just to recap what she said there, a lot of people are proud of their hiring process and they will publicly write about it. Like, I don't know if I've actually written about how FreeCodeCamp hires, but like, if you want to work at Free Code Camp, you just have to be a prolific volunteer contributor. And 100% of our hires come from people who are already essentially working as volunteers in the devel the developer community. Uh, so if you can find like how they hire, that can be huge information because you can just kind of go right into that slipstream and uh, present yourself as an ideal model. So knowing a lot about the interviewing party and their uh, – they're thinking on things and how they think about, yeah. Were you going to uh, say something, Fizzle? Yes, and we have been getting a lot of requests from Twitter. Uh, Andrew, would you mind resharing the recruiters' lists? So I, oh, think I absolutely will, yeah. You should open source on GitHub, make a list or something, and then share it with everybody. Oh, yeah, if people tell me to do it, I'll do it. Yeah, right. and, and Laurence, if you want to write something we would happily propagate these kinds of things because this is precisely what people are looking for is just some some information that they can go on. Uh, but the one of the big takes, takeaways I'm getting, especially from hearing Aline uh, talk, is we should be practicing as much as possible. And, and this might be a really great time to just really go deep on learning algorithms, data structures, design patterns, and just getting really good at programming so that you can really nail those interviews. Uh, you can apply to hundreds of jobs, and you may have to apply to hundreds of jobs anyway to actually get uh, interviews and, and get offers. But that process will be much easier if when you actually do get those interviews and when you do, you know, you're prepared. Yeah. So in terms of just very quick advice for like what people should prioritize and you know, let's say that they have been handed this block of time that they, you know, had previously eight hours of sleep, eight hours of work, eight hours of leisure. Very few people actually had that split. It's probably closer to like four hours of leisure, maybe seven hours of sleep. But if people do suddenly have a few extra hours a day, what would be the most efficient allocation of that time? And we're just going to go once around, and that'll be our closing question. Uh, we'll start with you, Aileen. Great. So um, if I, it's going to depend on your seniority level. So for this, I'll assume that you're junior and you haven't done a lot of this before. Um, there's one great book whose name escapes me, but that I will get after this and tweet it out. Um, the theme of the book is basically algorithms and data structures for um, non-technical people that just learn to code. So it breaks it down in this very approachable way and isn't super mathy, is just mathy enough. Um, I think it's exceptional, so I will get that. Uh, that's step one, is to just get your head around what you're dealing with. Step two is to work problems on your own. Um, there's Leet code, and then there's a great uh, repository of problems that actually shows you exactly the steps that you would take to solve them called Interview Cake. Big fan of both of those. 
Step three, once you've read a, uh, read a little bit about this and then actually worked some problems, is to start practicing. Um, we are not the only practice site out there. I think we do a great job. But uh, even if you don't use us, if you go to interviewing.io slash recordings or just go to our main site and then in the nav bar, there's a link called watch interviews, you can actually watch other people practicing. It's kind of like a uh, boring Twitch, if you will. Uh, <laughs> but if you haven't seen these interviews before, you're just going to see what interviews are like with Google engineers and Microsoft engineers and LinkedIn engineers and Airbnb and a bunch of other companies. So just watch those uh, and then once you get over the shock <laughs> then start practicing because working problems on lead code is very very different than working a problem while somebody is breathing down your neck and watching your every move it's really really nerve-wracking but the good news is once you get used to it and once you get used to thinking out loud it gets better and then, of course, um, potentially one of your practice interviewers, who's probably from Fang, can refer you into that company. So there's there's a journey if I were to do it. Awesome, thank you, Aileen. Uh, and uh, Laurence, if you were if you were going to go apply for a job and you had some time, how would you how would you spend that time preparing for a job application spree? Yeah, I think I mean everything that she said about interviewing was great information. I think. Beyond that, though, just trying to build a community and build, I don't like to use the word connections because it feels so like, oh, yeah, I'm like going networking events, which we can't even do right now. Can't go to meetups or networking events, um, but just building friends, essentially, that work in the tech space. So obviously, Free Code Camp is a great resource for that. There's also a number of different Slack communities for developers or for other folks that work in technology or design. Um, there are online events like this, and I know because I keep seeing a bunch in the news, there's other kinds of online conferences, and I imagine they have like maybe like a virtual breakout groups of sorts where you can meet other people. And I think that is just like a great way to spend your time right now. And as you were um, chatting before about uh, getting jobs at startups, I just remembered, I had a flashback to someone I worked with at my last company who studied philosophy in college. He was the company's first customer support hire. Um, he wasn't great at that role, but he taught himself how to code on weekends and nights. And he ended up building the first internal staff app. No one asked him to do it. He just did it on nights and weekends. Super helpful for the company. He then became an engineer. And now to this day, it's like six years later, he's leading the entire internal tools pod and has people reporting to him. And this was someone who learned to code on nights and weekends, has a philosophy degree. And he just kind of showed up, put himself out there, did things on his own, took, you know, initiative and of course made connections with people at the company or made friendships and he's still there to this day. So I think just making yourself useful and building um, or building friendships. Okay. Awesome. And Andrew? Oh, cool. Yeah. So I would say uh, you want to build and ship and document. Okay. So build applications, ship them off to small, uh, small startups, document your, uh, your journey. So, so people can, uh, can uh, find how you're doing stuff. I believe there's a lot of startups, small startups that are are hiring. You you can uh, uh, create yourself your own role that is irreplaceable. Uh, and I think there's a lot of there's companies that are going away, but there's a lot of companies that are are uh, thriving in this industry. So look for those particular techs and try to focus your energies uh, there. Uh, and I think if you do those three things, I think that's going to be a lot more valuable than uh, anything else because. If you can produce a value or result for a company in the form of an application, that is your proof, right? Um, so that's that would be my approach. Awesome. Well, I want to thank all three of you. Uh, everybody watching, scroll down, follow these people on Twitter. They're super interesting. Uh, check out interviewing.io. Check out Exam Pro, and of course, uh, all the awesome free courses that uh, Andrew has already published on Free Code Camp uh, for AWS certification. Check out the Learn to Code With Me podcast and uh, Laurence's blog. Uh, there are a ton of resources out there. Everything you need to prepare for the developer interview process is out there. Just explore those resources. I hope you all learned a whole lot from these three people who've been there and who've, who've done that and are kind of sending information back through time to you at your earlier stage in your careers. Um, thank you all. And we'll be right back with our final panel of the day, which is uh, around finding freelance opportunities. So don't go anywhere. Uh, enjoy some slides and some, some music for the next 
10 ish minutes, and we'll see you in a sec. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. This is the final segment of Lockdown Conf 2020. We might do another one, <laughs> depending on uh, feedback. Uh, I am going to get a survey out uh, shortly after the event with the hashtag Lockdown Conf. Uh, so if, if you all have feedback on ideas you'd like to, us to discuss for future events, let us know. Um, but I am thrilled to introduce you all to three prolific uh, freelance workers, very experienced in this field. They're also people who have contributed a great deal of uh, look lessons and, and courses to FreeCodeCamp over the years. Uh, first, Bolaji uh, from Nigeria. He is a uh, seasoned freelancer, and most recently, he's working at Hashnode as a developer. And uh, he knows quite a bit. We're going to hear a lot from him. Hello. How, how's everything going with you, <laughs> Bolaji? Hi, Quincy. How's it going? Yeah. Great to have you here. Uh, next, we have Phoebe Von Fatel, Fadel. Um, she is a developer in the UK, and she has also worked extensively as a freelancer and now is working full-time at a company as a developer. Um, welcome, Phoebe. Thank you, Quincy. It's good and to be here. It's good to have you here. And we have Luke Siciliano, who literally wrote the course, the book, on uh, freelancing. And he has uh, done an incredible amount of freelancing over the years. He, I believe, has done 25 years worth of freelancing and running a consultancy that does freelance development work and SEO consulting and things like that. So we are privileged to have with, with us this walking, talking repository of freelancing wisdom. <laughs> So thank you very much yeah. for joining us, Luke. Oh, well, thanks for having me. It's Honestly, it's my pleasure to be here. So. Yeah. Well, uh, we are going to be talking extensively about freelancing. This is a time when many people are looking for work. Uh, many people have unfortunately lost their jobs just in the United States alone. Uh, unemployment claims, which is just people who can actually successfully get through the phone to claim unemployment benefits. Uh, 16 million people over the past three weeks. So this has been absolutely devastating uh, to people here in the U.S. and I imagine also in, in Nigeria and in, in the U.K. and Europe. Uh, and we are going to, um, we're going to delve into all that, but I just want to preface this with everybody who has, who's listening here, who has been laid off or has been furloughed, we are very sad about that situation. We are going to do everything we can in our power to give you the tools that you can go out and you can find other organizations in need, small businesses, large businesses, uh, nonprofits, <coughs> other organizations, and that you can help them solve their own problems uh, through technology as a, as a uh, freelancer. So um, my first question to all three of you, uh, and, and we can start with Phoebe. Um, what is freelance software development and how would you describe the field of freelancing as far as, you know, doing software development? Um, so from my experience, I, I freelance for experience because um, I'm a career changer. So I went from one industry into another and a lot of what I was doing, I was learning at home. And I wasn't having that kind of um, sort of more practical experience. So I started freelancing and the easiest thing for me to do was to do uh, WordPress sites because it's, you know, it's very low cost uh, for the client. And um, so from that point of view, it, I kind of approached um, sort of local businesses, um, family, and asked them if they wanted websites. So I started quite low key. Um, purely for experience um, and it kind of like snowballed from there really because I just did one site and then word got around and then it kind of you know it kind of had a life of its own so um, yeah so I think for me it was started off just to get some experience but then it kind of became a bit of a side business next to my studying and also I was looking after my two kids at home because I was a stay-at-home mum as well 
So for me, you know, you know, I, I wasn't um, aiming for something that I was going to do for long term, but it kind of ended up that way. Yeah, and if, if anybody is interested in Phoebe's story, it's really remarkable. And uh, she's written about it at length. Uh, if you just Google from stay-at-home mom to freelance developer, I think is the headline, uh, you'll pull it up. Uh, maybe somebody can share it in the chat for everybody. Uh, but so Phoebe used freelance development as a way to transition into tech, and I think that's pretty common. Uh, Bolaji? How about you? How would you describe freelance development and, and your experience freelancing in the past? Okay. Um, so basically, I've, I've been freelancing for like two years now. And at the point when I started, I was just possibly a beginner. And like, you know, before you get hired, you have to get to a point where you're really experienced, at least um, to pass the interviews and all that, right? So at that point, I wasn't really so good, but I knew what I was doing. And so that's one of the best way I could practice my skills, you know, try it out with friends, families and all. Hey, I can do this. I can do that and all that. So and then people were really interested in how, um, having me um, build stuff for them. And then through that, I was able to get um, started with, um, with building projects and all that. And I was able to build stuff, like a lot of stuff, and then I had um, so many clients around me, and then while growing, I was learning more, and then I eventually um, got hired and then started working professionally, but still, I still freelance even up to now, like I freelance like virtually every month, because like I started with freelance, and like it's really cool. Awesome. And uh, Luke, tell us a little bit about your experience in 25 years ago, how you got into freelancing. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say more than anything, it really just started by coming across a few people with some problems that I knew how to solve. Um, the specific answer to your question is uh, I got asked to write an app uh, for a local deli that wanted to have a Street Fighter 2 tournament back when playing games in the arcade was you know, like actually a thing. So I wrote an app so he could track that. And then one thing led to another. I would really just define freelancing more than anything else as as an individual solving other people's problems. I mean, and as long as you just keep doing that, people are going to keep calling you. Okay, awesome. And uh, let's start with talking about what kind of, how the market may have changed for freelance developers. Because prior to freelance developers, you know, we weren't in a global recession like we are now. A lot of people had a lot more cash on hand. Uh, now, Things may have tightened a little bit. The kind of people who were looking for freelance help may not be looking anymore. Others may have new problems that they're looking for freelancers to solve. Uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about uh, the kinds of new clients you're getting, Luke, and, and how they're approaching you. Um, right now, I would say it, it's the market's definitely changed. And number one, like you were saying earlier, I mean, we're all really fortunate to be in a spot where we can keep working right now as opposed to being furloughed. And um, so I'm just kind of trying to make the most of that opportunity. Uh, in terms of clients right now, the first thing I noticed is quite a bit coming in from current or previous customers. Um, just to give an example, um, I built a progressive web app for a small church about a year ago and uh, because of what's going on they couldn't hold services so they wanted to integrate vid video streaming into their website so getting a, a surprising number of calls from either customers i've been helping on an ongoing basis or previous customers just needing something else done um, in some regard um, in terms of other business beyond that i think that this has really uh, created possibilities. Um, while I know a lot of people uh, may look at a time of crisis like this and think that possibilities may be decreasing, it's true that a lot of possibilities decrease, but other ones open up because anytime anything creates a problem for small businesses, that's a problem that needs to be solved. And nine times out of 10, or a lot of, I shouldn't say nine times out of 10, but a lot of times developers can solve those kinds of problems so it's definitely creating opportunities anything ranging from for example um the small local restaurant that knows they've needed a new website and an app for the last 10 years and they've just never gotten around to it now all of a sudden they're prioritizing that so you know people can order online um you know, the consulting firm that's used to dealing with people one-on-one, -on -one, now they've got to deal with everyone virtually, so they need a mechanism where people can securely submit documents to them, um, things like that. This has really changed the 
business needs of a lot of different types of companies out there now that those are problems that developers can solve so those are the new kinds of customers i'm largely seeing as people that now have a problem that they didn't have before and they need that problem solved and like i said that's after just doing things for previous customers yeah and, and that makes perfect sense so your previous customers are proactively reaching out to you because you're on their radar um, and and the, they know that you have proven that you're capable of solving their problems in the past, so they're reaching back out to you. Um, Phoebe, if you were to uh, like not magically not be working in your current job, hopefully <laughs> that doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, uh, but let's say hypothetically you were to go back on the market as a freelancer, like how would you reestablish contact with past customers and let let them know, like, hey, I'm I'm back in business and whom would you approach and like what would be your general strategy for that? Um, well, actually, I maintain contact with um, all my clients. A lot of them, um, I have like a care package for them. So I maintain their domain and their hosting and I get in touch with them, you know, once every couple of months and sort of say, is everything OK? Just checking in. So I kind of maintain that relationship with them anyway. Um, but in terms of sort of finding new clients, I think it's just um, usually actually I get approached. I get approached now, um, even when I'm working full time. Um, and with the pandemic, actually, uh, I think people have had that kind of downtime when they start thinking about um, I, I should really get back into looking into that website that I need to update. So I've had um, actually a few contacts that have gone touch with me saying, can you work on the website? So a lot, unfortunately, I've had to turn people away, but I've referred it to other people I know in the field. Um, so I, it's kind of it's kind of a strange situation because I noticed that the work stopped, and then the moment that this horrible situation happened, people started getting back in touch. So um, I guess like you know, I would probably approach local businesses, see if they're okay, and sort of say, do you need any kind of updating? Um, and that's what I did when I was freelancing anyway, I would sort of make contact and usually through uh, my existing networks. So it doesn't look, come across as cold calling, I guess. So, you know, you say, hey, I know this person, you know, heard that you might possibly need a website updating. And I think that works best, kind of building that trust um, and, you know, having that kind of credibility already. So, it's, you know, if you get referred on by someone else, that really helps. So... Awesome. And it's great to hear both of you have existing relationships that are continuing with these people. And, and a lot of things that if you're new to freelancing, you may think, oh, I built that and it's done. But it sounds like a lot of your work uh, as a freelancer is maintenance of code and making sure that things continue to work. Would you would you say that's accurate, Phoebe? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, definitely. And it's just, you know, a lot of time, you know, um, some of my clients don't have a massive budget. So they say, oh, I want this. And I said, but they can't afford to do it. And I said, well, that's fine. You know, we can build features on top, you know, once you get the budget. Um, so it's, it's you know, so it's kind of prioritizing what they want and what they need and trying to differentiate the, you know, rather desire versus what they actually need to get the website off, you know. So, um, yeah, so I say definitely maintenance and just adding new features as well. Um, it's just kind of a continual relationship. Awesome. And uh, Fazul, uh, yep. within the Hashnode community, what pro what proportion of people would you say that are really active on Hashnode are interested in freelancing or doing freelance development? Uh, I would say uh, we don't get a lot of uh, questions or discussions specifically for you know, related to freelancing. So uh, I'm not sure that we can uh, I can come up with a number on number of people who are actively looking for freelancers on Hashnode yet, because uh, we don't get questions on those uh, on on this area. Okay. Right. Well, well. Do you uh, have you noticed any discussions around this uh, that you yeah, think uh, so, would linking yes. to? Yes, uh, one question that I have um, like uh, often come across is people like there are developers who are. Um, Trying to get into freelancing for the first time, this may be this may be new 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 uh, developers, beginner developers, or experienced developers. So, what advice do you have for uh, people like this? Uh, how can they start their freelancing career? Okay, awesome. Uh, and uh, have any of you found like aside from 
uh, Luke's comprehensive course, by the way, uh, it's right here on this YouTube channel. You can check it out after this if you're interested in freelancing. Uh, it's several hours long, and it he also has like a lawyer, uh, like a small business lawyer and like an accountant. Uh, so it, it's kind of full spectrum small business advice for people who want to become freelance developers, and I strongly encourage everybody to check that out. Aside from that, uh, what are some other resources you all have found over the years that you've found helped you a lot? Uh, communities uh, or other uh, learning resources that are useful for uh, freelancers that they should be aware of? I, w I honestly think the things I found most useful are not necessarily even uh, related to uh, working as a coder or, or freelancing in general, but just uh, general business books, uh, general personal finance books, things of that nature. Um, I strongly, strongly, and a whole bunch of stronglies uh, think that you know, working for yourself as a developer, or working for yourself as an independent baker, or working for yourself running you know as an independent auto mechanic, really aren't all that different. I think you know a lot of it just kind of comes down to. Um, the same ideas and some same basic principles. Um, so I think anyone who is trying to strike out on their own right now, in addition to just reading as much as they can about, uh, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't limit your reading to how do I start up my independent dev shop or how do I start making money as a freelancer? Start reading as much as reading and absorbing as much as you can about being self-employed in general. I would say that that's the, probably the best resource that a lot of people could engage in. A uh, couple of books I would probably suggest just off the top of my head. Um, one is called The Millionaire Next Door. Um, I actually think that should be required reading in high school. So that's just you know my personal opinion, which you know, it doesn't count for much, obviously. Um, that one, uh, a book called The Innovators by Walter Isaacson. Um, is you know like a really really good one and a book called Profit First, um, which is really just about managing the finances of a small business. Profit First might even be the first one I would say somebody should read right now. Yeah, and I haven't read The Millionaire Next Door, but my understanding is it's an older book, and it mm -hmm. it really uh, the book's core thesis I think is that anybody who's working like a middle class type job, and this may not be completely true in 2020 where we've got you know. A lot of people working as contractors and having limited access to opportunity. But people who are making like the median level wage for an American, which would in America, it's about I think it's like sixty thousand dollars is now the median wage. It's, mm -hmm. it's gone up a little bit. Um, if you can figure out ways to cut costs and, and save a whole lot of money, you can use that as a as a nice cushion, and you can invest that in the stock market. Maybe not the stock market, but you'll you'll get um, enough recurring revenue from that that it just keeps reinvesting and i think it's like the benjamin franklin quote about like the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest right uh yeah actually that may have been an einstein quote because it doesn't sound as profound coming from somebody who's focused on money but from somebody who's focused on science i think uh that compound interest is so powerful uh so so just to to process a little bit about what luke said there general business books can be just as helpful as anything else because a lot of what you're trying to do is figure out the physics of business uh, so that you can keep your organization alive and that ultimately you can provide your for your family and uh, you know keep the the cash coming in which is the lifeblood of any business um, so so thank thanks for sharing those yeah. Uh, Fazil. yeah so one question that we have uh, is uh, how can uh, freelancers market themselves, developers, developer freelancers can market themselves during these times, like if they are starting out? what uh, Do you have any tips for them? And it'd be great to get uh, your perspective on this, Balaji, if you have advice since um, I know uh, Nigeria is a very competitive market. There are a lot of really skilled developers there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so when it comes to marketing, it starts from your network itself. Um, it's much more like internal than external. So marketing starts from your small peers, like your friends, your families, your neighbors and all that. So like you start marketing from people around you. Um, like your closest peers should understand that this is what I do. And then they are the ones who like go out and market to you externally and say, oh, I have a friend that does 
this. So you, you possibly might not be able to reach out to someone. Um, let's say Quincy, I, I might not be able to reach out to Quincy's friends. But Quincy knows me, right? And he knows I, I, I do this stuff and I do it well enough. So Quincy can go out and talk to um, his friends about me and say, oh, I do, I do this stuff. And then that's it. They reach out to Quincy and Quincy connects me to them. Like I've done like a huge marketing right there, like without having to um, do a lot of marketing strategies and all that. Like I just work with my peers and work with my friends, right? And another good option you might want to try out is social media, like that's a really good place to like market yourself. And one thing you should note about marketing is people would um, love you if they can see what you're doing, right? So like, I'm not just marketing and saying, hey, I can build this stuff and then that's it. No, I tell you I can build this stuff and this is the stuff I've built, right? And then I look at it and I'm like, wow, this is awesome, I like it. Like. How can I reach out to you? Can you do the same stuff for me, right? So I am marketing with like proof. I'm showing them samples of stuff I've done. And then through that, I can get more um, clients and more returns from that. So it's it's very simple. Start marketing from your peers, like your small friends and families. And then as much as you're trying to market on social media or other platform, try as much as possible to show samples, show them stuff you've built, like live projects and all that. And through that, you would be able to like, Get a lot of clients that would be interested in you and even if they would not be interested at that moment like it's more like stored in their catalog and they're like ah there's this guy i saw like one month ago who i'm um, this awesome stuff right and i want to reach out to him so like just by doing that alone you're preparing like uh, more clients for yourself so that's it basically awesome and uh one question that we have from chat is uh how do you figure out how much to charge as a freelance developer and uh how do you triangulate prices that clients will actually pay you that's a hard one <laughs> um yeah. yeah i mean like i think for me um because I was new to the scene and i hadn't had much experience um i kind of just did it as I'm starting from the bottom. I'm just going to charge for my time because I'm getting experience. Take people are taking a chance on me. And I kind of took it from there, really. And also with demand. So the more demand that came in, I kind of adjusted my prices accordingly because, you know, um, so it, it, I kind of like respond to the market almost. But at the start, I did kind of offer a, I built um, my first site for free. Uh, because I wanted the experience, I kind of wanted to do a um, real kind of client relationship, but not have that kind of pressure on myself. And then, um, and then from there, I kind of did um, what I would call the equivalent of minimum wage. Um, and then once I kind of built up my confidence, and I thought, ah, oh, okay, and now I can start charging kind of more of the rates that I. I think equate with my skills so it's just kind of building up from there really and you know it's it's a hard one I mean like it also depends on your client's budget and you kind of don't want to undersell yourself but you also have to sort of if they say we've only got x amount of pounds to do the site you can say I can build this this and this for you and you kind of prioritize what can be built so um, I would say it just depends on your experience um, and 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 just take it from there really the more you build the bigger your reputation becomes you get more kind of clout and then you can probably start charging a bit more so i kind of adjusted as i went along and that makes that makes sense and that's a really reasonable way to approach it um and how about you luke like how have you negotiated uh price elasticity among your uh your clients um Fortunately, right now, I'm kind of at a phase where my price is my price, and I don't you know, negotiate it down too much, to be frank. Um, now, if I wasn't in that situation, um, I think what Phoebe said, uh, just said, hits the nail on the head more than anything. Um, when she said, uh, when the client says, here's my budget, and you say, I can do A, B, and C. Um, to do a, I, I just think that's an important, just such an important part of selling something and coming up with the right price. If, you know, if, if a customer says, you know, I want items one, two, and three, and, and the developer just says, here's what it's going to cost. And they say, that's not within my budget. That, that, that's kind of the developer saying too bad. And then, you know, the person's obviously 
not going to buy the services and it's not good for anybody. Um, another way to think of that is don't end by telling somebody no, right? If somebody says, I need one, two, and three, and this is my budget, um, and you just say no, then that's just the end of the conversation. Whereas what if you say, here's what I can do for you. So it's kind of like, well, um, you know, I can't build you your own, uh, you know, I can't, you know, I can't build your own, uh, uh, video player, but I'm happy to embed YouTube for you so you can stream it live. So in other words, end with what you can do for them as opposed to what you can't do for them. And then they suddenly feel like they're getting a deal within their limited budget. And it helps make the sale, helps keep the price down. And it just works out better for everybody. And a lot of times uh, clients may not know what they want and they may, but they do know what the problem is. So they're the stakeholder. Mm -hmm. They can describe what the problem is. And as a freelancer, you can interpret that problem into a potential solution and right size yeah. it and, you know, make it like, like you just said, the cost of creating your own video streaming tool and uh, having your own video player and all that stuff may be prohibitive, but the cost of embedding YouTube may only be, you know, a day's work uh, to right. be able to have them have a tool where they can update the video and everything. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I think what you just said is actually really, really important. Um, I've finished uh, two sports-related apps for different clients. I would so uh, doesn't matter. Let's call it within the last thirty days, and um, you know, and everybody else on the panel will, will can talk. Will say this too that you know when we get clients that call us, a client will say, you know, I want whatever it is they want, and it's really important to give those clients feedback. You can give them possibilities that they didn't know they had. In front of them, they they'll instantly see how those possibilities can, you know, help their business. And it's also important to give them feedback if they're saying they want certain features or functionality that you know from having done something similar is probably a bad idea. It's important to, in polite terms, explain to them why it's a bad idea, why they shouldn't, you know, spend the money on that, and um, so on and so forth. And that also just really goes a long way towards. A, getting people to sign up for with you. B, you know, helping them, you know, get the most for, you know, like their money and and things of that. Um, you know, it's really important as a freelancer to think of yourself as a problem solver, and it's hard to solve a problem without giving feedback to somebody, right? Um, so I just, I, I just think you really just hit the nail on the head. That's really important to not just take a call and say someone says to you, "I want one, two, and three, and you just say okay. It's really important to give them that feedback. Um, yeah. I just wanted to add to what um, Luke said. Um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree about giving the client feedback because a lot of the time they don't know what they want or they don't know how the best way to solve the problem. So, um, and I find that, you know, because some people probably think, oh, I shouldn't really say that. They probably think I'm being critical. But in fact, they appreciate the advice because you're, you know, you, you have more experience that you know what you're talking about. So um, they're like, ah, I never thought of it that way. So actually, giving back feedback is is probably a good thing and you should be honest as well i think that's that's another thing don't just keep on saying yes yes i think that's a great idea i think being honest and they actually do appreciate that so yeah i just wanted to add that to luke's comments awesome uh, i have an interesting question for luke uh, luke if you had to start freelancing today what are the three things you would not do what are the three things i would not do if i had yes. to start that list is probably a lot longer than three things, first of all. <laughs> um, and it would also include a lot of the mistakes I made early on. Um, if I had to start over today, um, I would say so, some of the things um, that I would definitely stay away from, and this is going to sound counterintuitive um, to a lot of people, um, I wouldn't focus on trying to get as many sales as possible on day one. I would really focus on trying to get that first sale and doing as good a job for that client as I could. Um, in other words, get that first product in and probably just focus on that until it's out the door because then not only have you been paid for a completed product, you've got someone who's a potential referral source now because you've just done a really good job for them. Um, so one thing I think a lot of people a big mistake a lot of people make early on, myself included, is how do I get my name out there to as many people as possible on day one? It's like, no, no, no. Get your name out there to one person who will hire you 
today. You know, that's that's probably the first thing I would do. The second thing I would definitely avoid, and this is going to sound counterintuitive um, to a lot of people, is I would avoid going to a lot of networking events, um, which is another mistake I made early on. Um, you know, once when you go to a networking event, there are so many hours in a day, and that time is gone forever. And for the most part, it's all they're all a little different. But for the most part, you're hoping to meet people that will connect you with other people at networking events. I think if you're going to go out and try to sell yourself to people like that, it's you can just as easily spend that time walking into the local bakery and saying, "Hey, you know, I notice you don't have online ordering. I notice you don't have this. Let me solve these problems." So go out and try to meet your customers one on one, as opposed to trying to meet them through other people. That was another mistake, you know, I made um, early on. Um, and I would say the third mistake um, that I probably made early on that I would uh, definitely not repeat is, and this may sound like I'm on my soapbox, but you know, definitely learning as much as I can about the business issues from day one, getting set up uh, for proper tax structures and th- things of that nature. Um, because kind of what Quincy was saying about compound interest earlier is really true. And if you start off with some bad structures in place, um, and I, by structures, I mean how you've structured your business for taxes, um, how you've set up some of your workflows and those kinds of things. If you start off in a bad spot, those things are just going to compound as you start getting uh, more customers and more and more money bleeds out of your business as a result of it. So, you know, in not, not necessarily in those orders, in that order, those are the three things I would really not do is, you know, and again, I think what I did early on is what a lot of people do. I thought, oh boy, I'm in business and I just went plowing out without thinking about how do I structure things for taxes and, you know, like, like things of that nature. And at the end of the year, I regretted it, you know, like way back when. So. Wow. That's a great list. <laughs> how about you, Phoebe? Um, I would say, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's different from, because I, I used to work for a company, they took care of, you know, paying me all the taxes and there's, quite a steep learning curve when you go self-employed you know you you have to you know you have to do self-assessment in the UK you have to be aware of you know you have to have um, insurance to make sure that you know that you don't get sick if you get sued you're covered <laughs> you know things like that that you don't necessarily think about because you you haven't had to think about it yet so I think it's like what Luke said it's just kind of having that infrastructure in place you know using kind of an online accounting tools um so I started using Wave, which was an invoicing tool rather than producing them myself. Um, you know, things like that. Just kind of learn as you go on the job. Um, but it is quite hard. I mean, I think you have to have to be prepared for that. You you know, you don't have someone else taking care of that. You don't have like a HR department. You don't have a finance department, you know. So it's it's all you. So if you are going to freelancing, just just kind of be aware of that and um, read up on it. Make sure you're aware of what you know you need to do to to um, so that you don't get hit by the tax man and you get fined, etc. So um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, I didn't realise how much was involved, um, and I wish I was better prepared for it at the beginning. But you know, once I did learn, I I made sure that I caught up with it. So awesome. And uh, Bolaji, what are some things that you made mistakes you made early on that you've uh, kind of learned from? Okay, yeah. Um, so the first thing would be understanding that um, freelancing is not just about writing code. Like it's way much more than just writing code. Like it's it encompasses um, communication, marketing, and so much more. So like if you focus at the early stage is just writing code, you would miss out from so many goodies. I've had times where I had to write like serious complex features for the clients, but meanwhile they really don't want all that. And then at the end I have to like cut down most of those things, and I'm like, what? This is really good. Like you you need this, you need that, and like nah, I don't need it and all that, right? So, um, the ability to communicate well with your clients, it's very, very essential because like Luke said, like most of them don't know what they want and most of them, they have ideas of what they want, but like not like the full idea. And then when they tell you, I want X 
and then tell them, oh, you can you can get like an X Y Z or something, and they're like, oh, this is cool. And most time you can tell them, um, you can get like an X Y Z, and they tell you, um, I don't really need that. That's too complex for me at the moment. And then you have to go back and forth, um, trying to um communicate with them. It's so like. First of all, understand that it's not just about writing code, like it's way much more than that. So if you're working for a company, you have tax and all, so you just go, just pick a ticket and just work on your tax. For freelancing, you're trying to build something for someone who is not you. So like you have to put yourself in their position and try to understand what they want. And this also leads to like my second um, regret that I would like, which I never did is try as much as possible to give feedback to your clients. like. Um, let's say weekly uh, okay let's say the deadline for the project is like one month try to give like demos in like maybe four times in a month because like if you wait to the end of the one month you might present the entire demo and they're like wow why this why that and then you have to go back and revert so many things like right so you can do weekly demos with them and then the first week you look at them and tell you oh, um i change this and change that and then you can easily revert because you've not gone too far but like imagine you've gone like one month into the project you have to go back to like three weeks ago like that's really, really stressful. So the ability to give feedbacks to your clients like um, weekly or like three days, it's very, very important. And I think the last one for me would be to automate stuff. Like I made, I always tell people like, as much as we are developers, like we have so much to do, like there's so much to do. You have to install this, install that, like the tooling we use is quite much more than the code we actually write. So like one thing we should try to do is um, automate stuff. And that's one mistake I, I never did. So like the time I spent trying to do some basic stuff, if I had automated them, I wouldn't have to spend that time doing those things. So like you can use aliases and, and so much more, like try to automate some of your toolings and workflows. So it makes, um, it gives you much more time to like do more work. So like that's it. Awesome. That's an excellent answer. All three of you have a lot of wisdom on this topic. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the experience of trying to, because a lot of people ask, like, oh, I'm in India, specifically trying to find freelance opportunities. And I realize that's probably very different from the U.S. Uh, in terms of, like, we have completely different types of businesses uh, here in the U.S. And, and lots of different opportunities. Are there any, Is let me just say, is there any advice do you think specific to people in your country or your region uh, might be really helpful for uh, finding freelance customers? Uh, and y because I I'll just say that like a lot of people, a lot of times I'll give people freelancing advice. I'll be like, oh, well, why don't you try talking to this and this? And they'll be like, well, it's a little bit different in India. We don't have that. Like uh, I, I realize this is a really, really vague question, but I'm just curious if there's some insight that I, as as an American, uh, am missing out on that uh, in the more global freelancing uh, field might be like super actionable. Um, I think um, it's something. I mean, I don't know if it's specific to the UK, but I found um, that a kind of um, approaching people face to face I mean I know we can't do that now but during the pandemic but just kind of all picking up the phone um that really helped kind of having that kind of one-to-one -one relationship um and I noticed that when um you know particular clients they kind of wanted you more local so uh they didn't want someone who was abroad they wanted someone local that they can sort of go to it's kind of like even though you can work remote they kind of wanted that safety net like you yeah. know we want to be able to you know call you or you can come to us and you know you can talk it out so it, it's kind of um i don't know if that's specific to the uk but i found that with clients they kind of it does help kind of being in that local area and having that option to to kind of get in touch with you when they can on their time zone and um or, or if in person or on the phone that's just that kind of availability thing i don't know if it's if it's kind of a, a specific uk thing yeah and i find that too that of the new customers i get who aren't you know existing i mean i get them from all over but i do get a surprising number just from people that are looking for somebody in their local market um the one thing i'll say wherever anybody is is yeah, it, try to approach people from a problem-solving standpoint. I know I keep saying this over and over, and I I don't mean to sound like a broken record, um, but like right now, you know, like here in the United States and here in Dayton, and I think just about everywhere in the United States, uh, most restaurants, for just as an example, most restaurants can only do uh, 
you know, like carry out. So instead of, you know, if you're going to, let's say you're going to cold call people, instead of cold calling, you know, just random businesses, you know, the restaurants have a problem that needs solved. You know, they need people to be able to order food online and schedule a time to pick it up and things like that. So instead of saying, I'm going to, instead of taking the approach of, I'm going to look for work and I'm just going to call every business in my neighborhood, you know, like let's say, or something of the sort. What I would say is identify a class of customers and under the example, I just gave restaurants and, you know, then say, here's a class of customers. What problem are they having specifically right now, especially right now with everything going on? And when you call them, you know, you're not going to have to tell them they have a problem. They know they have a problem. And, you know, I think a lot of people will be surprised at how often, they are pleased to be getting a call from somebody, you know, is reaching out with a problem solving standpoint. You've got an issue. Let me fix it for you. And so I think whatever market you're in, whether it's a state somewhere in the U.S., whether it's a, another country like India, whether it's a place like the U.K. or just pick a place, try to identify what kind of problems people in that market are having and present yourself as someone that's solving them. And I really do think that's the biggest answer to the question. And one of the things that you touched on there is because we're all trapped in our homes uh, due to the pandemic and, and doing the responsible thing in social distancing in, in virtually every country. I think in some places like South Korea, they've got the testing so on lockdown that they are uh, able to release the lockdown. <laughs> that was really bad. Sorry. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to um, ask is what are some strategies? Because, you know, there's, of course, email, there's calling. But what are some some ways that generally seem to work for contacting people virtually when you can't just walk into a bakery and, and say like, Hey, I've been using your bakery, like buy something and then like use that as like a reciprocation technique or something like that. By the way, I can build this for you. You know, when you can't actually talk to people face to face and you have to rely on email communication or other modalities, what are some tips? Are there any specific platforms that you found are really helpful for uh, finding clients, anything like that? I mean, honestly, I, my first suggestion would be to just call people on the phone. Um, and, and if you call and you leave someone a voicemail and, or a message on their machine and, you know, say you're calling a local business and they don't call you back, don't be shy about calling, say, over the course of a week or two. Don't be shy about calling two or three times. Now, after a while, if they don't call you back, then obviously you stop calling them. But don't be shy about, you know, call, you know calling two or three times. Um, getting someone on the phone is just a lot more personal than you know, an email or something of the sort. Um, so a, I would say get people on the phone, but also as soon as you get people on the phone, you know, uh, present, I would say present it from their perspective. Um, you know, like, let's say, uh, uh, like I just built an app for a laundromat in, my local area and uh what's well, a dry cleaning establishment and just because of the situation he, he doesn't want people coming up to the window you know he wants people you know scheduling stuff and so when i call him and uh talk to him about i know you you know you um i know you're preferring to just do scheduling like etc cetera, etc cetera. and i said let's build something so people can just schedule online with you okay um so for example if you're calling a restaurant you know present it as i would like to help your customers be able to order food from your restaurant online. You know, not, I want to hire, I want you to hire me to do something, you know, present it as here's what I want to do to help you improve your business. Here's what I want to do to help your customers. And I think that's just a, in just my personal opinion, I think that's a way better way to approach somebody versus, um, Hi, I'm a web developer. Um, I'd like to talk about building something for you, which says, pay me some money. Whereas, let me help your right. customers, says, let me help you make more money. Yeah, and it, I guess you can always pitch it as like, look, you're going to make a whole lot more money. The money that you're ending up paying me will just be a drop in the bucket compared to the additional business you get. Uh, so, so that, like, the benefit to them is going to completely offset any cost to them. And, mm -hmm. and ideally, there won't be any risk either. Uh, mm -hmm. right. So, um, how about you, Phoebe? Do you have any tips for, uh, how you, in the past, have you, how did you find your clients and how that would be different today when we're all under lockdown? 
Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a hard one because um, I did kind of rely more on the face to face. And I think I built a lot of kind of clients through that medium. But, um, you know, I guess you can just transfer that to more kind of video conferencing. Um, I mean, like it's, it's strange with the younger generation. I find that they kind of prefer to be messaged, you know, kind of like uh, WhatsApp and things like that initially. Um, so, I, I mean, I would move it more to kind of having regular meetings, but instead of face-to-face -face, having the video conferencing using Google Meet or something like that. Um, um, but, yeah, I mean, like, it's it's kind of, in a way, it's it's no different. Um, you know, you're just using a tool to talk to them. But um, I think uh, if you are going to approach clients, like what Luke said, I think it's you have to approach it the right way. You're, you're, you want to become across as the problem solver. And I find that if you do your research on the business, it really helps. So then it looks like you've put the effort in. So, you know, um, I always look at it to see if they've got an existing website, how could I improve it? And then you've kind of, you know, and usually they kind of appreciate that. So kind of not just cold calling said, hey, I'm a web developer, what do you need built? You kind of say, oh, I've looked into your website. I think you can improve this, you can improve, you know, you look at the analytic, you know, the, um, you can look at the speed of the website, if you can look at, you know, the accessibility, you can go into uh, the, the Chrome Dev Tools and have a look um, through Lighthouse and you can sort of, you know, you can you do things like that and then approach them. So, um, but yeah, I think it's just kind of getting your foot in the door, um, you know, getting them to respond to you and you can, and I would say be persistent, email, you know, phone calls, you know, and, and yeah, and I say utilize your network as well. Awesome. And Balaji, how have you found your freelance clients in the past and how would that be different now uh, in light of the pandemic? Okay. Um, so for me, I, I never really um, went out to look for clients at the early stages. I much more got more referrals than me looking at clients and I never used emails because like emails doesn't work for me. I only use emails when I have to like maybe um, communicate like send files and all that. But like I tend to go more personal with my clients, like check them up and then we have video calls more often than normal and then we have phone calls because that way I can communicate more with them and understand um, their needs. Right. So I do that a lot. Um, I call them and then we chat and then we get to understand, OK, this is what you want and um, this is what you need. Right. And that's worked very, very effectively for me. And like one other thing I would say is trying to build up like your um, your portfolio, like your your reputation, because at the early stage, um, no clients will come up to you if they don't see something good enough you've done yet. Like that's really strange. Like it's really rare for you to find that. So like while you're starting out, you need to build more stuff because like you get more clients when they see you've done more stuff because most often clients would reach out to you either from seeing um, your work from somewhere else and then they like reach out and like, I want this same thing, right? So try as much as possible to like build up your portfolio, like allow your clients to see one or two or three projects you've done that are really successful. And that way you can easily um, communicate with them like it's not like saying I, I did this for this person and this is these are the results from um what i did and then here's what i can do for you also like i'm um, fully said like um reaching out to them by telling them you want to improve something from their already existing project is, is an effective way to like get them to use you i know i've reached out to some clients and i'm like oh i checked out your website and then it's not really accessible and they're like what's accessibility like i now have an opportunity like to explain to them what it really means and then tell them why they're losing out and why they're losing some clients and then i tell them your images are so large or like your your website is not optimized and they're like what's all that and then i i, I break it down to them and let them understand why they need to optimize stuff and why your website needs to be accessible right so them understanding those concepts they're, they're now like oh wow like i really didn't think about this right so they now have to like um go to the resources i sent to them and they say okay okay um i'm really interested in this and then how do we go about it so like i've done two things now i educated them on why they should solve this problem and then i can now come in and say oh now i'm here to solve the problem for you so it's much more than just um building the project for them like it goes beyond just trying to um understand the problem that comes from um their existing project like uh, luke said also when you understand um what problem they have already based on their existing project you can reach out to them and explain how they can improve it based on your own experience awesome and, uh, oh, go ahead luke can i add just one thing to all that i mean sure. i completely agree with everything and this is more just of an add to what everybody just said but the one thing i and to get back to it is in terms of getting business 
focus on your existing customers first. And, and it, a lot of people may sound feel like, oh, I've only got this one customer. I've got to go out and get some more. And just to give a, a personal example, call it 18 months ago, um, I built an app for a realtor when she was out uh, showing houses to her customers. One of her customers uh, liked the, the user experience on that. And he needed something. She referred him to me. I built something for him. He has since referred me to more people. So again, that all came from that one project I got for the realtor. So it's as, as crucial as it is to get new business and to how you sell yourself to people. The best way to sell yourself to people is by doing a really good job for the people you're already working for. That's just the most important part. Yep, I That's agree an- with that. Yeah, I agree. And that's an excellent takeaway to end our conference on. Everybody, you heard that right from Luke. The best way to get new business is to focus on your existing customers, dazzle them. They will send more business your way. Definitely resonates with what I've heard, and and both Phoebe and Balaji just agreed with that. So uh, I want to, first of all, I just want to thank Phoebe, Luke, Balaji. Thank you so much for being on this panel. Uh, You're Cumulative decades of freelancing experience are um, extremely helpful, and, and we've learned so much from your insights. So thank you for being here. Um, for everybody who's still tuning in, uh, it's been a four-hour long conference. This entire conference will be on YouTube at this, I believe, at the same exact URL. As soon as this ends, it'll take a minute. We're going to edit out like the breaks and everything. You'll have a nice three-ish, three and a half-ish hour video. You can watch again. You can watch it on double speed if you want. You can watch it on your phone while you go for a walk in a, uh, you know, in a safe manner outside. Um, we hope that there's been a lot of insight here. Uh, thank you to everybody who tweeted questions. Thank you to everybody in chat. Also, I've been reading your uh, it's, the chat's been super positive. I don't think we've had any spam or anybody that's needed to be banned or anything because we put that member paywall up. Sorry. <laughs> for, I mean, it's like $2 uh, or $5, depending on where you are in the world. So I really appreciate uh, all of you supporting Free Code Camp. Uh, that you know has basically offset the costs associated with this. There's one very special person whom I want to thank, uh, and, and uh, not just Fuzzle, who's been incredibly helpful and uh, has been an amazing co-MC here. Um, and it's pretty late in India, so I really appreciate you staying up. And thank you to your family for tolerating that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 11.30, and uh, I really enjoyed this uh, conference. Uh, Quincy, thanks for uh, partnering with us and making this happen. And thanks for giving us an opportunity to be a part of something like this. Awesome. Everybody check out the dev blog functionality on Hashnode. I did it and I wrote an article for how to get started. Uh, just Google dev blogs and you'll learn all about it. Um, the, the one person I super duper want to thank, the person who's been doing all this AV and spent you know an entire, the equivalent of an entire day, uh, maybe a day and a half, uh, setting up these graphics and, and making sure the slides all look good. And also... Uh, just meeting with every single speaker yesterday to do sound check. I just want to give a very special thank you to Matthew Potter. Uh, he's phenomenal. If you're looking, speaking, so this is the freelancer panel. If anybody's looking for uh, somebody to do a conference like this on their own YouTube channel or Twitch or wherever, um, he, he's your man. Uh, and he's he's based out of Toronto. Super helpful. Just just DM me on. Uh, Twitter and I can I can put you in touch with them. Uh, I also I just want to go through and thank everybody who's been involved, everybody. Uh, and I'm just going to go through and uh, I've got the entire list of names. I just want to read through. Thank everybody. So first, this is all alphabetical order. Alien Learner, Interviewing.io. Check it out. You can get interviewing practice. Uh, and she's got so many great articles on Free Code Camp's publication about the nature of getting a job and the numbers behind it. She is very data enthusiastic. Uh, Andrew Brown with exampro.co. Thank you, Andrew, for your amazing AWS tutorials. If you want to get AWS certified, check out the AWS certified challenge, hashtag AWS certified. In Free Code Camp's new Discord uh, chat, we have uh, a room just dedicated to that. So if you want to become a cloud engineer, you're in the right place. Uh, Dawal Shah with Class Central. Again, he eats, sleeps, and breathes online courses. He knows more about it than anybody I know. Uh, he's he's one of the reasons Free Code Camp exists. 
I was doing something focused on MOOCs early on, and I was like, man, I can't compete with, you know, Dawal Shah. His his uh, his site's too too comprehensive. It's too good. He cares too much about online courses. So I just focused on coding, right? But uh, I want to thank Dawal. Check out ClassCentral.com. Emma Bastian, check out the Ladybugs podcast. Congratulations to her on landing her new dream job. She said the free code camp was really helpful uh, for her preparing for this uh, new job transition. Um, Balaji, right here on the call. Thank you so much, Balaji, uh, for joining us from Nigeria. Um, and, of course, Laurence Bradford, Learn to Code with Me. Excellent podcast. She has 120 interviews with developers just in the backlog, and she's going to record some new ones too. Uh, and she just got married. Congratulations, Laurence. She just got married during the pandemic. If you go to her Instagram, you can see the pictures of her doing this like uh, social distancing wedding. It's really profound. Uh, but congratulations to her and her spouse. Um, uh, Colleen Schnettler, the work from home uh, super mom <laughs> of three. Uh, amazing woman. She uh, has a video on Free Code Camp YouTube. I don't know how to find it, but somebody can find it and share it where she basically walks through a day in the life, how she handles everything, how she works from home with kids. Now, I don't think she has the benefit of being able to get childcare anymore because of the uh, pandemic. So I'm not sure how she's handling it, <laughs> uh, but she's handling it. And uh, yeah, it's her little Pomodoro plus yoga. Very cool tip. Um, Luke Siciliano, again, freelancing extraordinaire, a wellspring right. of knowledge. Thank you, Luke, for joining us. Oh, thank you. Um, and be, be sure to check out his freelancing course. Uh, Phoebe, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Phoebe Von Fidel, Fidel um, out in the UK, now working not as a freelancer, but a, like doing full-time work, but still has her freelancing chops and uh, knows a lot about the field. Um, Sid from Code Sandbox, thank you for joining us. Uh, hardcore dev, knows a ton. Uh, has worked at you know Auth0, is now working at Code Sandbox. A uh, lot of engineering expertise there. Uh, Tech Girl 1908 is her handle. Angie Jones, check her out on Twitter. I follow her. I follow her for years. She's like just super enthusiastic, and and she brings a lot of interesting uh, perspectives and shares a lot of resources, especially around testing. Um, and of course, the Coder Coder, Jessica Chan. One of the best Instagrams for programmers. You should absolutely be following her on Instagram. That does it. I just want to do another thank you to the Hashnode team uh, for everything they've done to support this uh, and uh, all their volunteerism preparing. You know, they prepared backup questions in case me and Fazl didn't have any good questions to ask. We had like this whole ream that we didn't have to ever reference really. Uh, and I want to thank the Free Code Camp team, of course. Uh, I'm just going to rattle off the names very quickly <laughs> since they've been super duper helpful and, and I just want to recognize them. Uh, Tom, who just joined a few days ago, right off the top of my head. Bo for running the YouTube channel, which has grown dramatically. Uh, people are learning a lot from home and we're thrilled to be part of that uh, process and we're thrilled to serve as a, a learning resource. Uh, of course, Abby has been running our social media. Thank you so much, Abby. And, and also, she's an editor for the publication, doing a whole lot of other stuff, too. Uh, runs the Free Code Camp Instagram. Yes, we do have an Instagram. It's really fun. Check it out. It's, it's lighthearted. It won't stress your brain too much. You can decompress and watch other people work. Um, and, uh, of course, want to thank Bragesh in Bengaluru, keeping the servers up despite the double load this month. Uh, I want to thank um, Ahmed. Abdul Sahab over in Turkey, doing a lot of the design work, helping us increase our donations by actually slightly optimizing the donate page, something that we should have done a long time ago. Uh, and of course, I want to thank, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of everybody else that works at Free Code Camp. Mia in China. This is probably going to be put into uh, Billy Billy, which is the Chinese YouTube. So thank you, uh, Mia, for everything you're doing to lead the Chinese community. Um, and if I left anybody out, <laughs> I apologize. Um, I just want to say that it is with profound uh, gratitude that you all have come to watch this, that uh, you all are here 
learning these insights from all these people who've been there in the trenches for years. If you are one of the many people who have recently lost their jobs, uh, my heart goes out to you. Don't despair. The remedy for despair is action. See what you can do. Focus on providing for your family. Focus on keeping the lights on, the heat on, keeping food on the table. Absolutely. Focus on keeping sane. Once you've covered those bases and you want to climb a little bit higher up the, the pyramid, so to speak, of, of hierarchy of need, you can actualize. You can become a developer. The opportunities are out there. Many of the trends we've seen uh, toward automation, uh, toward remote work, are only going to be accelerated by this pandemic. Uh, this, like, software development is probably one of the fields that will be least impacted by the pandemic and all the economic destruction and all the lives lost. Uh, so we can be very grateful for that, if nothing else. So uh, the one other person I want to rec recognize, Chris, Chris over in South Korea. Uh, congratulations on your country's extremely good response. <laughs> Hopefully it can be a template for everybody else. I know like Singapore and Taiwan are following close. Uh, so Chris is doing a remarkable job, instructional design. Awesome guy uh, on the free co-camp team. Sorry, I didn't want to omit him. I knew I'd forgotten somebody. Again, thank you everybody for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed Lockdown Conf. Uh, I'm going to be sending out a server survey. I'll just tweet it from my with the hashtag Lockdown Conf. If anybody wants to fill it out, give us some ideas for future panels, future panelists. Um, we may do another one of these in the future. Again, thank you all. Have a beautiful day. Uh, it, for those of you who are getting ready to go to sleep, I hope you get a good night rest. Wake up tomorrow, have lots of energy. Cheers, everybody. Happy coding. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.